What's up, everybody? This is Josh coming to you with another episode of the Affiliate Marketing Show. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest affiliate marketing news, tips, and trends. Once again, I'm Josh from OfferVault.com, the industry's largest aggregator of all things affiliate marketing. And today, a big shout out goes out to our newest sponsor of the podcast and a good friends of mine, Max Bounty, the industry leader in CPA networks. With two decades of excellence under their belt, Max Bounty is marking their 20th anniversary as the go-to platform for affiliate marketing, recognized as the top network by both OfferVault and MThink. Max Bounty continues to set the standard for performance marketing with a diverse range of verticals, including financial, insur insurance, market research, and e-commerce, offering affiliates unparalleled opportunities for lucrative partnerships. And here's the icing on the cake, folks. In April, Max Bounty is running their Beat Your Best promotion, rewarding affiliates who exceed their performance targets with exciting bonuses. But that's not all. No sorry, Bob. Max Bounty's owned and operated campaigns are consistently smashing records with millions paid out to affiliates. Don't miss out on your chance to maximize your earnings with Max Bounty. Join the winning team today. We also have Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, as well as the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, plus our very, very special guest today, David Packhaus, CEO of Singular Sound, a company that focuses on developing, developing innovative tools for the musician community. He's also the former VP of AEY Incorporated, where he won more than $300 million worth of contracts to supply the US government with weapons, as seen in the film War Dogs, where David is portrayed by Miles Teller. And Adam, David, Harrison, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. The guy who the movie War Dogs is based off of is in the apartment that was filmed in the movie Penthouse. War Don't Dogs. Penthouse. Don't fuck us, dude. Oh, sorry, sorry. Penthouse that was filmed in the movie that is now the Ringba Mastermind Suite. This is pretty sick. Yeah, that's that's how it went down. Um, before we get started, though, Josh, I just want to mention to the CEO of Max Bounty, Matt, I really appreciate your sponsorship, but you did not spend enough money to get me to wear your swag. And I challenge you to do that. I would love to fanboy you and talk about how Max Bounty is amazing. It's been around for over 20 years. All the affiliates love it. You pay all your bills on time and you're one of the best CPA networks. But I can't do that because you didn't pay me enough money. So. Simply put, I'm more of a whore. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the money, Matt. We well, I think, we're, I think we're all whores. You're just a cheaper one. Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Oh, this is going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be a good So, so really David, good. let's start off with a very simple question. AEY Incorporated, what happened? Ooh, now that's, a, that's a, a big question with a very long answer. But uh, AEY, for people who don't know, uh, was the company that I was working in, uh, which uh, uh, for the uh, story that War Dogs was based off of, it was started by um, a friend of mine that uh, I met in my young teenage years, um, Ephraim Diveroli, who in the movie is played by uh, Jonah Hill. And uh, we had met when I was about 16, he's actually four years younger than me. So he was 12 years old at the time. Our parents both went to the same synagogue and neither of us liked to pray. So we'd sneak out of prayers and, and hang out on the basketball courts. And that's kind of how we got to know each other. When he was uh, 16, he got kicked out of uh, his Jewish uh, high school. We didn't go to the same school, but uh, similar types of schools. Um, and he uh, he got kicked out for smoking weed. He got sent off to L.A. to work for his uncle. Uh, his uncle owned this big pawn shop um, in South Central L.A. And one of the things his uncle sold was guns and various other uh, gear, like tactical gear and stuff like that. And he got obsessed with guns as a teenage boy. He started selling the guns to the customers. He started buying and selling guns on the Internet, on the gun boards, using his uncle's company. Uh, worked for his uncle for about two years. His uncle also taught him how to bid contracts to the government, to the state, local, and federal government. Um, for people who don't know, the way the government buys things is, is by law, they're required to put purchases that they want to make uh, out for open bid so that the government gets the best possible price and spends the least amount of taxpayer money on it. So 
uh, they'll put it out on their website and then everyone who's qualified to bid on the contract uh, can submit their best price, their offer to the government. And then the, the government decides what's the best value to the government, picks the winner. That winner can deliver on the contract and then collects their, their profit margin. Um, so Ephraim learned how to do this working for his uncle, worked about two years, and then he had a falling out with his uncle. Um, and they each claim the other screwed the other, you know, I mean, they're, they both have terrible reputations, so I, I believe in both, but, hmm. uh, <laughs> um, he moved back to Miami and, uh, started a company called AEY Inc., which it was actually his dad's company. His dad had, uh, named it after the initials of his three sons. E is, uh, Ephraim and the AEY. It's, uh, Avrami, Ephraim, Yeshaya. So it's his dad's three sons' names. Uh, so unlike in the movie where he's like, AEY stands for nothing. You know, it's, it actually is, uh, <laughs> the initials of his three sons. So, um, uh, he's, you, he registered AEY, Ephraim registered AEY Inc. with uh, the federal government to, to uh, bid on federal contracts. And this was in 2004, 2005, right after the, uh, the war uh, with Iraq started, after the invasion of Iraq. And the Bush administration was trying to build a whole um, dem a democratic government there. And part of that was supplying their military and their police force and uh, the Iraqis were trained on Soviet uh, Warsaw Pact type of weapons, which the United States doesn't manufacture. So that meant that all the weapons and ammunition uh, had to go out to third party brokers. Um, so Ephraim got really good at bidding on these contracts and started winning a bunch of them. And after about a year, we bumped into each other. Uh, we were at a mutual friend's house and he asked me what I was doing. At the time, I was uh, going to college. I was studying chemistry. I was working part-time as a massage therapist. I also had a few side businesses. I was selling SD cards online through eBay that I was buying from China. I was, um, and I was importing bed sheets and linen. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So that part is true, actually, but not the way they portray it in the movie. I, I never took delivery on like- They never boxes. brought up the SD cards. Yeah, the they, they didn't mention the SD. They wanted to simplify the story. Sure. So. <laughs> they, uh, I also was doing a lot better uh, at the time than they portray in the movie. In the, in the movie, I'm like about to go broke and go bust from yeah. the inventory. You had exactly. Bunch Wait, of so the movie yeah. wasn't totally accurately portrayed? <laughs> <laughs> not, not totally. I would, I would say, I would say the movie was about if I had to put a number on it, sixty nine percent accurate. Oh wow. You know, okay. I'll just coincidentally, it. that we'll about it. that, about that. And it, it was mostly accurate, but there were large chunks that, of course, it's Hollywood. Uh, they have to follow a specific uh, formula and an arc, and it has to fit into a minute, an hour and a half. And and so, yeah, they compress years into an hour and a half, and they need to have a certain amount of of action and a certain amount of relationship drama, yeah. a certain amount of comedy and drama, you know, drama and and all that stuff. So. Um, I like that they did portray yeah. you as a young hustler, though. Yeah. And I mean that in the context of like young entrepreneur trying mm -hmm. to figure out his way and navigate mm -hmm. the world, yeah. because I think, you know, Harrison and I as entrepreneurs also mm -hmm. started exactly the same way. He was selling coins and like uh, diamonds and coins for my first business. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? I had another period in my life where I wholesaled like phone accessories. Oh, wow headphones, cases. I sold so many otter boxes, like <laughs> random stuff. So, you know, nice. I just, whatever I could find my, my mm -hmm. hands on, like whatever I could find, yeah. I sold it. Right. Same You're, for me. I yeah. sold my first business was store return power tools. Oh, yeah. And then I liquidated toys, like shitty toys by the semi truck load in downtown Detroit. Like just crazy. So it doesn't surprise yeah. me that right. that's your background and story. I think yeah. most entrepreneurs actually start out that way. They're yeah. like, I need to do something. I need right. to flip something right. yeah. um, before they, they build a real business. Yeah. My first business was actually as a garbage man <laughs> when I was six years old. Nice. Yeah. At age six, that's when pretty, I, yeah, six. pretty sweet. Yeah. I, I started with my older sister who was seven and a half. And uh, this was in Israel. Uh, there was no garbage chute and no elevator in the ele in the building we were we were living in, and so we'd have to take the trash down the stairs and out to the dumpster on the corner. And my mom was asking us, my sister and me, to like take out the trash, and uh, and we were complaining about it because we didn't want to do it. And then my dad says to us, "You know, you're complaining 
about this, but it's really a big opportunity because all the neighbors don't want to take out their trash either. So yeah. you can offer a service where you take out their trash and they'll you, know, you charge them some money. And we thought, wow, that's a pretty good idea. So we went to all the neighbors and we offered them a, a subscription service. Every other day we take out their trash. Uh, I think it was for a shekel, which comes out to about a quarter a week. Nice. Yeah. And we signed up like eight neighbors. And then uh, two weeks later, we told our dad, this is way too much work <laughs> because we, we were small and we had we had to use like our mother's cart with wheels to like sure. get the trash all down the stairs and <laughs> out to the dumpster. And um, and my dad says, well, what if you were making twice as much money? Would it be worth doing then? And we said, yeah, well, for twice as much money, it'd be worth it. But we just told the neighbors it was a quarter a week. You know, how could we just double the price? And he's like, well, if you don't double the price, then you're going to quit anyway. So you might as well give them the option. Tell them, yeah. And so inflation. We, yeah. <laughs> so we went to all the neighbors and we told them the price was now double. And uh, six of them uh, said, no problem. We'll pay 50 cents a week. Uh, the seventh quit. And from then on, we saw their daughter start to take out the trash, which we'd never seen before. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that daughter hated you. <laughs> she was a good daughter. So I ne she never gave us the stink eye or anything. I, I don't know if they explained to her why or who gave them the oh, idea. Okay. They didn't throw so you under the they, bus? Yeah, maybe not. Um, but That's but nice. we did, yeah, we did see her take out the trash. And then one neighbor in classic Israeli fashion says... What? You can't double the price? This is crazy. Maybe this week you put it up five cents. Next week, maybe 10 cents. But doubles is crazy. You can't just do this. And, and we're like, no, no. A quarter. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's exactly when I think about it now. It's like an extra quarter per week. Per yes. week. It's not even a day. And uh, and But we stuck to our guns. And he's like, okay, fine, 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 fine. <laughs> wow. And you yeah. didn't meet him halfway. I respect yeah, it. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, kids in Miami, if they yeah. offered this service, they'd charge... Eight hundred dollars a week. A week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they have an eighteen percent gratuity yes. automatically <laughs> added <laughs> onto the check. But then they ask you for an additional tip after yes, that. Of course. Right. right. Of yeah, course. Right. Yeah. Of course. I feel yeah. like we could we could probably spend the entire episode talking about uh <laughs> what you went through with AEY, but I, I would say yeah. probably just watch the movie to sum it up for about 69% right. accuracy. 69 I am curious. Accuracy, yeah. I am curious. This was a question Harrison yeah. posed to me, but are you still allowed to bid on government contracts after all the shit that went down or, or so have you kind of I, been like, yeah, go ahead. So I was banned from doing business with the government for 15 years. Uh, and just yes. recently, when did, what year did that start? Uh, it started in 2011. Oh, so you're coming up. Yeah. You're getting your due yeah. soon. Yeah. Uh, so I can't do it uh, directly. My Actually, I think maybe I'm confusing it with AEY, the company. I know it was, there was like the personal ban and then the corporate ban. I think my my personal ban actually expired last year. So in the movie, yeah. they talk about how yeah. they might get banned because of those weapons. Or right. I know the story is a little bit right. different. But yeah, that's like you're in the middle of a contract and you don't deliver, so they they ban you. Right. That's different than like your ban, which came from. Yeah. So so there is different reasons for being banned. Uh, so if you fail to deliver on a contract, you can get like a black mark on your record, and it's actually they make it seem like it's an automatic ban. In reality, it just means that when you are applying for new, when you're bidding on new contracts. Well, they could look it up if they do. They don't always do that. And if they see it on your record, that counts against you in winning the next contract. Sure. It's not an automatic ban. There are some automatic bans, like like when I, you know, when the court says you can't. When the government yeah. says, yeah. yeah. Sure. So uh, you, when you were first kind of introducing the process of how it works and how the government has this system where, you know, me or you or someone watching can submit a bid, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the purpose of that is so that the government can get the best price that's right is that does the government always get the best price do they always right. pick the lowest price so that's a great question they the 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 wording the government uses isn't best price i, I assumed yeah. it's best value and uh, best subjective value, i like it right best value takes into account other aspects of of uh, what the government cares about. So price is a big factor. And sure. sometimes that's the main driver of value. But they also take into account delivery times and reliability of the supplier. Mm. And uh, uh, depending on the contract, the quality of what you're offering, like, for example, with ammo, um, you would have to tell them, like, what age... Uh, 
is the ammo? How is it stored? Is it uh, Does what? ammo expire? So it depends on how it's stored. Uh, if it's stored well in vacuum sealed tins in a climate controlled uh, situation, it can last pretty much indefinitely. I mean, we were delivering some ammo uh, that was originally manufactured, I think, uh, not long after World War II. Wow. And it was still and it worked perfectly because it was stored in in uh, in uh, a professional way. Um, yeah. But most militaries around the world, at least most first world militaries, they do have rules in place that they that they have a time limit of how much how comfortable they are, of uh, like the ammo that they're relying on to be in storage, because. To be absolutely sure, you need to inspect it and test it and stuff like that to make sure there wasn't a leak in the, sure. in, the in the canister or, um, and so the United States in particular has uh, the biggest defense budget in the world by far, a few times over. So the United States has very stringent uh, rules about how old they allow U.S. soldiers to use the ammo, but the federal government didn't care particularly that much about. The Iraqis and the Afghanis, who were our allies, they were more than happy to give them older ammo that they wouldn't have given to U.S. soldiers. That's interesting. Yeah. I have a question about where, where you source the ammo. Like, yeah. was this really just pounding the pavement when you went out and found suppliers? Mm -hmm. Like, are you just randomly calling warlords in the Eastern Bloc? Like, what exactly uh, is the process for right. doing the business development right. of ammunition at scale? Right. So that's a great question. Um it's partially that it's partially Googling and emailing and calling and faxing and whatever other way form of communication you can get to try to get through to these people and trying to convince them you're a real player and that to take you seriously and all mm -hmm. that. And having uh, had completed contracts for ammunition with the U.S. federal government is a big marker of uh of uh, that you're that you're a real player. So they if you send them, you know, a copy of a document or a link to an award that was posted because when the when the government awards a contract, they post it. Uh, on, it's all public yeah, so on Sam public. you can go and see exactly. the, the not the you can see what's closed for bidding and what's been awarded or if they didn't award anyone. Exactly. Um yeah. so you can see this company. Yeah. Like I was looking and there's like a couple companies that seem to win all food related contracts right. for like military bases right jails all around the country like there's like two companies that do it all yeah. i went into like a sam.gov wormhole last weekend there's in preparation <laughs> yeah. of this podcast it was yeah. very interesting yeah there's um companies tend to specialize in different niches uh so at aey we specialize in ammunition and uh, warsaw packed weapons in particular uh some companies specialize in food um my current partners in War Dogs University, which is uh, we're setting up to teach people how to do government contracting. They specialize in laundry services. And it was just something that. they kind of like fell money into. or clothing. Uh, <laughs> 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 Give me a second to connect it. Uh, you know, it federally contracted. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, when you're, when you're... They don't need anyone to launder their money. They print yeah. governments. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 print they the use money. the CIA for that. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, exactly. they have, we have a whole organization, yeah, yeah. three-lettered org for that. <laughs> so when I win a contract for something, let's mm. say, and I have a bunch of cool questions about this stuff, but mm -hmm. how, so in our industry, like the affiliate marketing world, uh, mm. the biggest problem that marketers have is they're, yeah. you know, they're buying traffic from Google, from Facebook, right. from TikTok, from wherever. And, you know, they're generating leads for insurance companies or they're promoting, a, you know, a you know, Nutrisystem for weight loss uh, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and they don't get paid right away. So it's a lot right. of floating. Right. And just based on like your, you know, War Dogs University, mm -hmm. Instagram reels and stuff. Right. This is a heavy float yes, world. So my is. question simply wrote, yeah. and I have like a bunch of questions here. Yeah. How slow does the government pay? And you, so yeah. tell tell me about that and, yeah. and our viewers, because I think they'd all be interested because this is a different world. But right. it's something that everyone watching has mm -hmm. to deal with often. Yeah. So uh, financing is a big part of it, because when you win, uh, the government always pays net 30 in general. It, minimum, is it net, net 30. 30 after delivery? After delivery. After they accept delivery. So monthly net 30 after delivery. So if yes. they... To break that down, if they accept delivery on April 7th, does that mean they're paying May 7th or May 30th? 
Usually it's May 7th. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's 30 days. Yeah, they, they don't do like end of the month thing. Um, now, there are there's many different government agencies and there is some variation between the government agencies of like how, you know, some certain agencies will insist on net 60, but most of them do net 30. Um, back when I was doing business, the State Department in particular would only pay with paper check. Huh. Yeah. And everyone else paid with a wire transfer. It was just, I don't know, their system. Each department has its own system. It's a big mess. Uh, hopefully they've improved it since then. But um, yeah. Uh, so it was net 40 plus check clearance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, if you're delivering to the government, you have to pay for whatever product that you are delivering or service that you're delivering. And then you have to wait 30 days later. Now, in some industries, yeah. I can imagine, like if you're an established player and... Um, I, I listened to some of your course and you were talking about delivering some forklifts mm -hmm. to the government. And I think in that case, if you're an established player and you go to a forklift manufacturer and they know you've sold it to the government, they're likely going to issue you some type of credit mm -hmm. or something to do acquisition. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like, I don't know machine gun bullets coming out of Moldova. Yeah, there's no credit. It's there. cash yeah, and yeah, carry. Absolutely. And then yeah. you have the shipping yeah. lead time to... Yeah. Uh, load it, freight on board it, you put it on a boat, takes yeah. 30 days, yeah. gets delivered to your dictator or whatever. <laughs> Not right. <laughs> We're delivering <laughs> only to the U.S. government. All right. Sure. Let me be very clear about that. Sure, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the U.S. government. Uh, well, um, maybe U.S. government back dictator. <laughs> I mean, it might be a dictator, but at least backed by the U.S. government. So I kid, uh, I kid. But but yeah. your delivery, where some military yeah. somewhere, and you accepts. also have to pay the logistics company in advance, and for all right. the licensing and everything. Yeah, everything right. does gets paid in advance. And so Insurance. you negotiate yeah. it, you pay in cash, it mm -hmm. gets loaded, it gets shipped, everything is prepay basically, and then thirty days after receipt, then they're paying. But you might be sixty or ninety out. Yes, correct. On your investment, or even one hundred and twenty out yeah. before you ever get paid. Yes. On it. Correct. That's wild. Yeah. So you need some serious financing to do these kinds of deals. The good thing about financing these deals is that at least you know that the that the customer is good for the money. Yeah. Because the customer prints the money. Yeah. That they're never going to go bankrupt. If federal government goes bankrupt, we all have problems. The whole world. <laughs> the entire world. Yeah. So it's not going to really matter at that point which That's business true. you're in. Yeah. Uh, so the federal government is the most reliable customer there is. So because of that, there's that element of the financing that is uh, that is a lot less risky as opposed to financing a purely commercial deal where you know some company may decide not to pay you and you got to take them to court and and all this stuff. As long as you fulfill the terms of the contract, the government will pay you. That's Amazing. and uh, and if they if there's disagreements about the contract, there are legal remedies and they have a, a system set up to uh, to have uh, uh, to address those kind of situations. Cool. Yeah. And I, I'd like to steer the ship here for a yeah. second, Josh, because I actually have to go a little bit early mm -hmm. here. I know Harrison has a bunch of questions about this for you and sure. I want you guys to continue. But um, I so just to introduce this, you launched the War Dogs Academy or you're launching it very soon. Yeah. Uh, Harrison told me a few minutes ago before the pod that he literally bought the course. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, thank my you. girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Awesome. And I went through some of your videos. Mm -hmm. I, I love the production quality you have thank there. You. And just you, you don't know us very well, but we were affiliate marketers for more than a decade. We've mm -hmm. promoted every kind of product under the sun. I literally just published my book here, The Paper Call Revolution, and did my first video sales oh, lander. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, like the book book has gone well, but, it, you know, the marketing we're doing for the book is going to be very similar to sort mm -hmm. of what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the, our viewers and uh, our customers are very interested in like the business model behind educational content. And right. so the one thing I do want to mention is I liked how much clear time and effort you put into it. Mm -hmm. And like you went to a sound stage and you clearly wrote your scripts and lessons mm -hmm. out and like you put the effort in. So this is mm -hmm. not like a guru course, <laughs> right. I think. And well, you've is, done it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this you. is why I yeah. actually asked Harrison to get some of the materials, because mm -hmm. if it were a guru type mm -hmm. course, I wouldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. But right. I really liked what, what you did there. You clearly have the experience behind it. So, like, let's start from the top. Mm -hmm. um, what 
like what really caused caused you to get started do the war dogs academy and then like what's the goal you hope to achieve beyond just like selling the course and making mm -hmm. money right because mm -hmm. you seem very mission driven and yes. like i want to understand what is the goal and why you're you're actually doing it great question great question so ever since the movie came out i've had literally hundreds of people um contact me um through you know my social media handles and uh usually it's someone who's who's uh down on their luck and they set to give me a whole sob story where it's like you know i was just in i am currently in the situation that you were in in the movie i have a, a kid on the way i i just got fired from my job i'm willing to work 20 hours a day i'll give you 90 percent of the profit just teach me everything right and uh well first of all i'd been banned from <laughs> doing business with the federal government <laughs> so for, for most of that time I, I couldn't really be involved but um uh, and so I hadn't been uh, been doing business with the federal government. Um, and then uh, around a year ago, a guy named Logan uh, contacted me and and uh, he told me, he's like, I just wanted to let you know that uh, my partner, James, and I, we watched War Dogs when we when we were 21 years old. And we were so inspired. We thought if these guys could do it, why can't we do it? Yeah. And so we just went down the rabbit hole learning everything we could about about government contracting we you know really bashed our brains against it uh it worked on a whole bunch of contracts uh, a bid on a whole bunch of bids lost a lot but eventually we went like got a big uh contract and nowadays we have a multi-million dollar government contracting Amazing. business Sweet. and and i just wanted to say you know thank you for the inspiration it's it's you know was uh probably wouldn't have done it if we hadn't seen war dogs and I thought, first of all, I thought that's so impressive, you know, that they did it by themselves. They put in the work. They figured it out. No one held their hands. No, you know, like, I mean, me, like I learned it from Ephraim, you know, like I didn't learn it by myself. He learned it from his uncle. I don't know where his uncle learned it from, but but it's difficult. It's it's not an easy business to get into. Uh, it's it's pretty complex. It's got a lot of a lot of technical legal legalese and technical jargon and stuff that you need to learn. And, and uh, which is why even a large, a uh, lot of um, large commercial companies don't sell to the government because they're a pain in the ass to deal with, which gives uh, uh, middlemen a big opportunity yeah. because they can go to all these commercial companies that don't want to deal with the government and be the middleman and take a percentage uh, take a profit. So, uh, so I was super impressed with Logan and James that they had taught themselves and launched this business by themselves. And I I had the idea. I said, well, I have a lot of people who are contacting me. They want to learn how to do this. And you guys are doing it right now. So why don't we create something where we could teach people how to do this? And uh, some people say, oh, well, if there's you're making so much money, why would you want to, more competition? Right. Why, why are you going to teach other people to compete with you? And they don't understand that the federal government. There's so, so many, like a trillion. I saw you post like a story, and it was like, how many, get, how it's many new contracts get posted 30, daily? Thirty thousand a day. Yeah, thirty like thousand. You contracts refresh, and there's more. It's ridiculous. Per day, per day. So it's like physically impossible to read them all, let alone work on them all. Mm -hmm. And so there's just so much uh, business out there. This is literally a, per yeah. a significant percentage of that federal budget that the government's always arguing well about i think this thing. look i think let's zoom out for a second i mean yeah. business in general a lot of people are very concerned about people copying their business or getting right. into their business or right. whatever it is yeah. but i think one competition pushes you to be better but absolutely. two that's a poverty mindset absolutely and yeah you know we live in a time where there's opportunity everywhere mm -hmm. and like the biggest problem isn't what oper you know where's the opportunity it's like how do you narrow your focus Absolutely. to pick an opportunity There's that so works many opportunities within, yeah, out works there. within your skill set? Yeah. And so like I feel the same way about the book mm -hmm. and like, oh, you're gonna bring more people into the industry. It's like, yeah, it's phone calls. How many people <laughs> right. a day pick up the phone and call, right? right? Like you think you can get them all? Right. You know, it's the same with yeah. government contracts. So yeah. I think that's a really silly question to ask yeah. an expert. Is mm -hmm. like, well, if you're if you're so good at this, why aren't you just doing? Well, first but... you were banned. Right. I Fair, was. Yeah. Right. No, I think it was just funny. But, yeah. but second, right. Like 
when you collaborate with, yeah. this has been our experience. When mm -hmm. you collaborate with other smart entrepreneurs and you're in the same business and you figure things out together, like it's one plus one equals three. Absolutely. And so we, I see the same thing, like from the book, we've, we've only sold a few thousand copies to date of the book at this point, but the feedback I'm getting is crazy. And the amount of people who are like, Hey, what do you think of this? And how do we do that? And the, the sort of masterminding that comes out of it is invaluable. Yeah. Like the amount of opportunities, like let's talk about what you're really going to get out of this besides right. the money, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of opportunities that are going to come to your doorstep from building this audience and helping people build business and changing the lives of their families is going to be astronomically bigger than the amount of money you make on the course. Absolutely. And we have very big plans for War Dogs Academy. It's not just the course. We want to build an entire community out of yeah. it. So we have a forum where uh, people who join the academy can interact with each other. They can trade tips. They can partner up if JV, they're looking for yeah. partners. Uh, and we also have quite a few investors who are interested in funding contracts yeah, run by our students. That's cool. And as we were talking of uh, uh, funding, floating the contract is one of the biggest challenges, in particular for someone who's starting out. If you're an established business, you've already got a relationship with the bank and credit cards and and uh, finances available. Available. But if you are a new entrepreneur, if you're getting into the business for the first time you might not have that available. And that even if you win the contract, you may not be able to deliver on it unless you can get it funded. And so that is not all service providers are willing to front the new guy on the block. You know, almost none of them are. Yeah. Actually. Do you have a standard yeah. legal instrument for the financing back end for your? For so we are still clients? we're still discussing the exact structure. We're going to do it. Um, I was just on. Because Harrison and yes. I would love to put together a standard legal instrument for that okay. and finance some of your yeah. students. Yeah, that would be because great. Because the government's great. Yeah, so exactly. Like, do you see, like they, literally, yeah, I'm yeah. sitting here thinking yeah. about they this. They pay their like, bills. Yeah, they, they pay, pay their, their bills. Good, good. Uh, you yeah. know, float on that. They never run out of money. <laughs> yeah, and not only not only that, like yeah. you know, we're gonna do this here. We were just giving mm -hmm. David a tour, Josh, mm -hmm. of uh, you know, where we're gonna host some mastermind events up here, and like those events. We'll spend like all the money people mm -hmm. pay for those events on the event. Like mm -hmm. for us, it's not about making money off We've, the event. We've right. lost money on most of them. Like yeah. a lot. It's because I over cater. It's a yeah. Like we don't care about yeah. that. But what happens in that room, mm -hmm. those hours, and like when we collaborate with people, they collaborate with our each clients other. Clients grow their business, and mm -hmm. you know, in turn, they make more money, but they spend more money on our platform. And that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. triple threat win. They grow, yeah. so two businesses win. We benefit. Everyone's happy. Amazing. They yeah. grow not yeah. only their business, but as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um. So, like, I jump to another question. I'm curious, and I have. I'll well, hold on. No, no, no. We got to stay on the course. Okay. Because okay. I got to well, go. It's about the course. I'm okay. curious. All right. <laughs> when when someone's brand new and they go yeah. through the course mm -hmm. and you you get them on there, mm -hmm. like, you know, is it possible that someone that has limited business experience can figure this out, or would you say Absolutely. it's pretty? I mean, look, I I can't speak to everybody. Sure. Right. And but I think that uh, we. Uh, we designed the course for beginners. We explain every terminology. We have everything in, in both video format because some people are visual learners. And we also have everything written down so you could uh, refer to the, uh, to the written format. And because we have the community, if there's any part of the course that anyone I'm is assuming you're active by, there too, yes, so yes. I could I, I could pick your brain about exactly, something. Yeah. So I'm active on the forum, and so are my partners Logan and James, and um, and so we interact with the community. There's something that is unclear in the course. We definitely want to know about it because we want uh, we see the our success long term as the success of our students. If we spawn a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 new companies, that is going to be the greatest mark of success because there's a million get rich quick schemes out there. There's a million get rich easy schemes out there. This is neither of those things. It's not easy. It's not quick. Well, right? let's touch on that too. Yeah. Some of your students who are truly going to be honest about it, ours yeah. too, whatever, mm -hmm. they're going to fail. They're going to yeah, invest absolutely. the money. They're going to yeah. put in a ton of work yeah. and then it's not going to work. But yeah. that's just business, right? That's true. doesn't that matter if business. it's with a course or without a course. That's exactly. just how it is. That is true. And some of your customers are going to buy the course and think that when they're done with the course, they're going to go get a contract and it's going to be easy. But like 
I understand how much mm -hmm. work a business takes. Sure. And so like any type of course someone buys, the amount of work they put into it is really what they get out. And, um, you know, I actually talk about this in my book, but a friend of ours has a mastermind program mm -hmm. and I pop in sometimes. And one time there was a student that had been in it for six weeks and was complaining he wasn't making any money. He was like breaking even, which I thought was yeah. great success at that point yeah. uh, in advertising. And I was like asking, how many ads did you create? Mm -hmm. How many landing pages? What What are you doing? And the response I got back was essentially like, I'm kind of part timing, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Like, where's my money? Right. And you know, I kind of lost it a little bit in this Zoom call. Like mm -hmm. you should be putting every free waking hour you have into sharpening your sword and learning your craft and mm -hmm. getting better at what you do. And I think it's that tenacity and perseverance combined with what like something like what you yeah. have that's really going to get a great outcome. Yeah, you're, absolutely. You're not the fire. You're yeah. just like some gasoline to that's pour right. on it. That's right. They still got to invest yeah. the time. It, there is no course or educational thing that will do your job for you. You still yeah, got to yeah. put the grease in. You your still got to you still got to put the work in. The cor what the course will do is it'll point you in the right direction and it'll keep you from making very costly mistakes early yeah. on. That is I think the best value of the course is that um when you're first getting into any business you're going to you're going to make mistakes. There's going to be stumbling blocks you didn't realize that that was going to trip you up. And the course is putting all of our experience into something that's easily digestible and formatted so that people can learn from our, our mistakes. And I've made a few, you know, of course. Um, and uh, and so that they could avoid it, it doesn't mean they're not going to make mistakes. They're going to make their own mistakes, but at least they won't repeat the mistakes that we made. So it starts them off at a much higher level than if they had just done it by themselves like Logan and James did. Yeah. And all your materials yeah. were really bite sized. Yeah. For me personally, mm -hmm. that's I hate consuming content that yeah. way because I don't know, I've been doing business for 25 sure. years. But for someone yeah. that's newer, I think right. the way you cut it apart and made it, you know, uh like binge worthy, very short uh yeah. lessons that people can refer back to over right. and over again. Yeah. I think was really well done. Yeah, thank you. Um we did that consciously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. did a, a really nice yeah. job with it. Yeah. And so I, I want to ask sort of behind the scenes because sure. a lot of our viewers are affiliates. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the affiliate marketing yes. show. Yes. And so like, are you gonna do an affiliate program? What like what's your marketing plan for this? Right. Like how how far into that process are you? So we are going to do an affiliate program. We have not set it up yet because we haven't launched yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our launch date is April 9th. So um, right now we've just been doing a lot of uh, podcasts. Like that's why I'm here. Sure. Uh, to to get the word out and to uh, and to get clips to post on social media and things like that. Um, we are. Uh, but but affiliate program is going to be a major part of it. So we're still working out the details of that. Uh, so I, I, I don't have any solid answers for you, but I can probably get you something after the after the uh, show because um, my partners I know have been looking more deeply into this. Cool. Yeah. And are you are you guys going to buy media for this yourselves? Uh, you mean like advertising? Yeah. 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 We are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to we're going to uh, try to blow this up as fast and as far as we can and. That means investing into uh, into advertising. It sure. means podcast appearances, affiliate marketing, pretty much every avenue and channel that we can think of to uh, to make this a big success is uh, is what we're going to be doing because we also see it as something that increases in value with scale, right? Sure. It's the yeah. the network effect that. Uh, social media is famous for the more people on a network, the more valuable that network. So uh, we're building a community. And people who are bring different elements of expertise uh, into that community, and we want them to teach each other beyond what they learn from the course from us and directly from us by interacting with us in the community. But I think there's going to be a huge amount of value of uh, people learning from each other as well, and a larger network will uh, will bring that in, as well as more investors, which the more investors there are, the better financing our students get and and things of that nature. I know you guys don't want to hear that, but <laughs> no, there's no, I mean, there's yeah, contracts. Yeah, 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 no, there's there's plenty. There's plenty. I, I'm just kidding. There's, there's an, an ocean full of contracts. There to be bid on it. That's, that's there the really is. incredible thing yeah. about 
you know, this, this industry, this business, yeah. it's completely different than what we generally talk about on the pod, but right. it's, it's yeah. huge. It's, it's a enormous. trillion dollar thing. It's, it's enormous. the government. Like, and they buy literally want. everything. So, it, you know, people know me for selling weapons and ammunition to the government, but uh, as I said, my partners, they specialized in laundry services. The government also buys educational materials and we're actually looking to into the possibility of selling the course as uh something for veterans who are uh getting out of the military and a lot of veterans are interested into getting into government contracting because through their military training they have experience in the various items the government buys well, don't they uses. also get preferential treatment um, and they do get preference yeah. that's right and they get preferential treatment so uh there's certain contracts that are veteran owned set asides they call it mm. it's a set aside meaning that this contract is only going to go to someone who has these qualifications so if you're a veteran they have an additional set aside for disabled veterans veterans, um, women-owned businesses, and various. We go through all the set-asides so you can figure out which is the best uh, uh, leg up that you can get so you can get every advantage you can um, uh, when you're registering with the government and when you're bidding on contracts, and you can bid on contracts that you have the highest chance of winning. And mm -hmm. so your time is best spent with that. That's part of the course is figuring out what set-asides you qualify for and how to apply for them. So uh, how many hours is the course? Yeah. Uh, I think it's something uh, long. I know we had an 18-hour video shoot. <laughs> that, that, that's how long we spent in the studio. Um, what it's going to get edited down to, I'm not 100% sure. But, uh, but we are uh, – but it, we realize that it's going to be an ongoing process because we did our best to be as comprehensive and as detailed and as well as keeping it as simple as possible so that beginners can understand it. Mm -hmm. But we know that once people start taking the course, we're going to get feedback Questions. and there'll be certain parts that maybe we didn't realize we had to go into more details and we'll continually make additional content to improve the course. Because as I said, it's, this is for us, this is not, um, this is not a set it and forget it thing. We're not, um, oh, I made the course. Let's try to sell it. And, you know, we want to build companies and we think we're going to make a lot more on the financing of the, of the contracts yeah. than on the course itself. So we are invested in our customers' success because the more our customers, uh, the more our students succeed, uh, the more opportunities we're going to have to, uh, to monetize their, their success. Well, I, I really like what you said there because I think, fundamentally any course program or yeah. any business in general it's not set and forget and i think yeah. a lot of people talk about passive income on the internet right there's really no such thing no passive yes. incomes yeah like uh you know it's passive income a treasury bond right <laughs> like true yeah, yeah i have some passive income yeah. but the reality is if it's related to a business your business yeah. is really unlikely to succeed unless you're going to do what you're talking right. about here which is like Hey, I'm going to continually learn. I'm going to continually do this. Yeah. I'm going to interact with my customers. I'm going to put in yeah. the work. Absolutely. Um, and so, and also in your case, I think if you you wouldn't do that, then it would be really hard for you to tell people government contracts are hard. It's going to take a lot of work. Yeah. Like right. I'm not going to put in the work in right. my course. Right. But, and right. so that's why but like I should. wanted yes. to see it first. Exactly. To see if yeah. it was like guru of or course. if it was of like course. the real deal. And so I think it's yeah. really cool that you put a lot of effort into yeah, thank this. thank you. And that you're backing it up yeah, because, you. you know, like, uh, you know, you don't really know anything about our business, Ringba, mm -hmm. but our mission is literally to help our clients grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so I vibe a lot with what you're saying. And uh, you saw our giant pile of awards. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that we're hanging cool. out there. Yeah. So like yeah. literally every single day, Harrison and I are thinking about how do we help our clients grow their businesses? Mm -hmm. Not how I grow mine, mm -hmm. not how he grows his. How do we help them grow theirs? And that's why you've been so successful. Exactly. Yeah. When yeah. you when you help others succeed, you succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And absolutely. That's, yeah, that's really I think the root mm -hmm. of uh, of how you do it. So I love to hear that about your business. I also think you have the amazing brand to go with yeah, it. Thank you. Like it's, it's like, like yeah. beautiful brand. It's yeah, a really thank nice you. package. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we put a lot of work into that. And uh, yeah, I just feel very lucky of how my life turned out. It could have turned out a lot worse. And uh, I'm very, very grateful. I didn't end up making millions of dollars from the arms business as I thought I would mm -hmm. uh, because my spoiler alert, my my former partner screwed me out of all that money. I, I actually didn't end up making anything. 
Um, but I came away with a great story, an amazing experience, and I have a Hollywood movie made about me. And how cool is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> and you have yeah, knowledge about something. Yes, that, exactly. You know, if you just go online and start looking about at this stuff, it's, yeah. it's not simple. It's not. It's not. Yeah. And most people uh, don't even know it exists. It's uh, true. Most people don't know how the government purchases things. They've never even heard of government contracting. And you'd be surprised even people in the business world are completely unaware of this entire aspect of the economy. And it's a huge chunk of the economy. And so one of the things we're doing as a uh, part of the economy, uh, part of the um, the academy, excuse me, uh, is focused on existing businesses as well, mm. where uh, our main focus is the is the solo entrepreneur who wants to get off the ground uh, like we were um, in the beginning. But we also have a uh, focus on getting current established businesses to offer their services and products to the government because many businesses aren't even aware that they could do this and that this market exists. And so for them, investing just a little bit into having some experts set their business up and uh, we have uh, um, consulting services that we are offering as part of it. So, nice. uh, so if a business wants to set their business up with the government and identify contracts, which they have a good chance of winning, we are going to uh, hold their hands, so to speak, and, and cool. direct them in that way yeah. as well. And that's good for yeah. you guys because the reality is selling yeah. a course that's not how you make money. You really right. have to offer back-end services. Yes, of course. And then yeah. that's how, how your clients really succeed, yeah. too. I mean, I was thinking, Harrison, I've looked into this before, but I was like, man, I don't really want to deal with the government, but I bet they buy a lot of minutes. <laughs> like, well, do you remember at Call Center Week? Yeah. yeah. We met this guy. We were at this trade show. If you are in paper oh, call, yes. do not go to Call Center Week. Mm. It's not for you. But we were at Call Center Week. We had, like, two conversations in like four, it was like a four day long expo. So all of our team member was like, why are we, like everyone wanted to kill me because I picked the booth. I'm, it's my fault. I own this. Um, but this guy comes up and he's like, yeah, like I'm pretty much, I forget what division, but it was like, I think all the government. No, he military, had the contract for 1 800. It was like go army or so. It was like no, 1040. It was the one for the IRS. Yeah, it was ridiculous. And he's like, you know, we don't really need call tracking, but we use something that was like billions of minutes per year. And I'm like, mm. uh, yeah. uh, the scale. uh, Adam, come the here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me. Yeah. And Adam and I were like, yeah, like, look, we'll be honest. We're like a whole platform. You probably have a pretty good price. <laughs> it's like, it yeah. just, that wasn't going to, we couldn't win the biz, right. but it was incredible to even talk with the guy about it. Cause he yeah. was like, holy shit. Yeah. You know, I mean, you'd be surprised. There's, oftentimes very lucrative contracts that have very few bidders on them mm -hmm. because people are just unaware of it, right? And there's people, there's whole businesses who built an entire niche of selling, like you said, there's like only two guys or two companies that win like all the food contracts, right? There's certain businesses that focus just on the government. They have their niche and they, they really work that and they build an entire business based on that. And what often happens is a few years go by and they get really comfortable and, and their margins so go up, right? They realize how much they could add to their margins and still no competitors. So they keep on adding to their margins. And that just leaves open an they enormous opportunity. Exactly. It leaves open an enormous opportunity for a new player to come and say, hey, Show I could do this. Points off of that I could do that for way less and maybe even just a little less and win that contract myself. And so that happens all the time. And that's what the government wants. Yeah. And so our long term focus with the academy is uh, from a more from a more uh, social level is to help the government become more efficient. You know, when we bring in a lot of new players into the game, those are very, that's a very lofty yeah. Yeah. goal. Efficient in government. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, negative it's, and positive. On yeah. Battery. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, there's definitely a large, the larger the corporate, the larger the organization in general, there's uh, more opportunities for inefficiencies, but that's why they build these, the system up. The system of competitive bidding is to keep uh, uh, corruption to a, a manageable level, uh, to a lower level and to increase efficient efficiency. And so, so people, hold on a second yeah. here. So let me get this straight. So yeah. people buy your course, yeah. they build a business, yeah. they start to 
win government contracts at yeah. a more competitive level than the government had before because of yeah. your course. That person creates a new business for themselves, improves the lives of themselves, their family, their yeah. employees, their team members, the people they're contracting with. Absolutely. Yes, and right. then fundamentally, the entire American tax base benefits from exactly. more competition exactly. on government contracts. Because less taxpayer dollars are going to pay for that thing because that person Fuck is selling yeah. it for less. It's incredible. And then hopefully we have politicians out there who will spend the extra money wisely. But uh, that's that's not up to me. Well, we, uh, we know they're not. So. I don't want you to right. hold your breath. Right. Right. Dude, we don't do it? politics on this I, show, yeah. but no fucking way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, everyone is. No, no one. Yeah. Everyone is. Every, look, I understand the skepticism with the go the government. I've experienced it myself. Yeah. Um, but uh, who was it that that's was it was it um, uh, Churchill who said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others? Yes, right, exactly. So yeah, I mean, you could shit on democracy as much as you want, but it will beat a dictatorship any day. No, um, we're big fans of capitalism. Yeah, and exactly, and and people shit on capitalism all day, but it beats communism any day. So uh, so yeah, I, I, I despite my my uncomfortable run-ins with the federal government and uh i i don't want to complain but i do believe that we weren't treated the most fairly uh by the government and the media but i still am uh i still very strongly believe in the united states sure and our capitalist system i think it is the best form i think it could be improved you know, well I'm, everything I'm, can be improved. everything can be improved but uh but for people who want to tear the whole system down i think they don't see the incredible wealth no. and opportunities that our system has given people and you know we have this client yeah. um he uh he's from venezuela and he told me his story recently we mm. were at um the ringba suite over at a heat game and he was just describing to me like what their their form of government did to no, the country. Yeah. And he was th thankfully able to escape it and runs an amazing business mm -hmm. here. And his work ethic is so amazing. And um, he's such a great guy. But just to like hear what the different systems do when it comes to opportunity. Yeah, I think um, is is always humbling. You know, like I said earlier in America, there's unlimited opportunity mm -hmm. and the people who can't find it are just not trying mm. like literally I there's no excuse in my mind for mm -hmm. someone that can't find an opportunity there's, there's a lot literally of posting everywhere everywhere it's not just an America problem right. it's a global it's an yeah. global problem I mean it's it's a mentality um I would say it's a lot worse in Europe sure. um as far as like first world countries go uh Europe also has a lot less of a you ever try to do business with someone in Europe in like yeah. July Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> They're like, "I'll hit you up in September." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lots of vacations. <laughs> We're on holiday. Yeah, Dude. yeah. So there is less of an entrepreneurial mindset in other parts of the world, and and that's something I've been very grateful for as far as the United States goes. Same. That the United States has a culture of entrepreneurialism, and uh, and the idea that people can can build something from nothing and really rise to the top is something that is pretty uniquely American. And there are other countries and cultures around the world that are trying to imitate it, but no one comes close to the United States. And and you could see it from the economic growth difference oh, of between the US and Europe and other first world countries. The United States is far outpassing them, far outpassing them in, in, uh, uh, in growth and economic growth. And that's mostly because of... Uh, of our entrepreneurial spirit. If you if you look at the the stock market, uh, I think one company in the United States is worth more than the, the uh, I think like Apple is worth more than the entire Australian stock market. Like, yeah. like the, there are ten thousand companies, all of them together. I, I, that makes me yeah. happy. They do yeah. have more kangaroos, but we kick the <laughs> shit out of their stock market. Yeah, we, I love it. I'm proud to be yeah, an American. Do. I should have worn my American flag pants. I wore yeah. ammo for you. Well, yeah. I like. <laughs> I love uh, I, your mission uh, yeah. about this and what we're talking about here because it literally plays into the same thing. You're like, mm -hmm. you want to create opportunities for others. It's literally our mission too. Amazing. And um, that's a that's a really cool thing. So I think that in a lot of cases, courses have a bad rap and a bad yeah, name. It does. But I think, yeah. you know, like we just met this mm -hmm. afternoon, but I think if you keep professing the message in the way we're discussing today, mm -hmm. I think it'll really vibe and resonate with to people. To hear what your ultimate goal is, like mm -hmm. outside of, you know, like, building a business and you know working with people that he wants to make wanna, money but you yeah. want to make money but you want to like yeah 
ultimately try to save the American taxpayer yes. money. It's amazing. I have a buddy who I believe it's, he, I believe Marines, he's an accountant at mm -hmm. a base. Oh, wow. And he and I, we went to Top Golf like over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me about the waste. Mm. Oh, yeah. And like, yeah. they have to throw away pens. What? Like, after a certain amount of time, they get a new order of pens in. Mm. They have to destroy the old ones. He's like, yeah, we literally like destroyed a bunch of steel case desks. We couldn't even sell them. Like, we got new mm. ones and we're, we, you know, they, they tried to sell them once, didn't get sold on like the liquidation yeah, sites. The liquidation we just have to destroy sites. that shit. Yeah. Like, the amount of waste and, and you know, then I said, well, well what type of pricing do they mm -hmm. pay? He's like, well, the issue is, and I'm sure you go into this in the course, is is the L word, liability. Right. So the government purposely doesn't really pay. They pay a lot for things to right. protect themselves and I guess indemnify themselves right. from the event of liability. So, like, for example, you're friends with laundry. Right. Someone has an issue with the laundry. They get sick or something. It, right. it doesn't fall on the military. It falls on them, on them for the yep. allergic reaction or whatever. And so right. that's why... You know, that's priced into doing business with yeah. the government, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot of complexity that the government has that gets priced into into contracts. There's um, – because the government is a political organization uh, – It's very true. There, there's um, political issues that get added into contracts. So, for example, um, when, when the government wants to buy clothing – they have to have a certain they have i think it's called the berry amendment uh, i could be wrong about the exact name but cool. but the um there's a there's a rule where a certain percentage of the material has to be uh cotton that was grown in the united states and certain amount of the yeah. manufacturing has to be done in the united states there is something called the jones act that the, the shipping right that shipping shipping and U.S. made ships that do the transportation between American ports, not international, between domestic ports. It has to be U.S. manufactured ships. And the problem is we don't, is manufacture, we don't manufacture ships anymore. And I know that companies so, ask for exceptions and very rarely are they granted. Very rarely. They don't make ships. It's yeah. crazy. I've and, read about that. And it significantly increases the costs of these contracts, of delivering on these contracts. So It's funny you mentioned that yeah. I, uh, like Adam and I, we kind of, uh, we own a travel agency. It's like mm -hmm. a passion business and we mm -hmm. sell a lot of charter flights. Cool. And, uh, uh, I saw like an aircraft that was in position in like New York or something, and he was perfect for a client mm -hmm. that was actually coming to Miami. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, I think it was like a British aircraft or something mm -hmm. or Singapore or whatever. Okay. So I sent him a quote request. Hey, can you do this trip? And they responded, and I forget the legal term they used, but they were like, no. We can't do that trip because it's within America. So the same rule applies not uh, with where the aircraft was manufactured, but the operators have to be American to do uh, flights within America. So they were like, if you're going to Canada, sure. Yeah. Mexico, anywhere, sure. But within America, yeah. we can't do the trip. Yeah, and I was like, wow. Incredible. Okay. So yeah. it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, One of these yeah. weird. It's uh, not very free market of them. It's, no, it's uh, yeah. the opposite of a free it's market. It's the opposite honestly. of a free market. Yeah. Yeah, and there's always been that those elements in American society of a pro free market and and more anti free market, and I think the vast majority of economists agree that overall free market principles are better for everybody. Everybody, but there's always going to be people who have who are defending their turf, right? So it may be better for everyone, but the I mean. I, I assume when the Jones Act was implemented, there were U.S. shipbuilders. We made who, things in America yeah, back then. Exactly. You know, just, you know. So they, they took out – they paid the lobbyists to take out those senators for dinner that day and explain to them why uh, – Cigars they, and scotch, yeah, right? Why they needed the Jones Act. And now we're – 100 years later, we're still stuck with it. And you know they'll never yeah. change that. It's like now it, – the optics it's, of it look bad. Yeah. I mean it, it takes a um, – it it takes a particular political situation to get these things changed. And unfortunately, I think for all Americans currently, there is a movement away from free market principles unfortunately, in, yeah. in uh, the political world. So yeah. what, you know, this is kind of a two part question. Um, you know, obviously you had some issues with the government, you were yeah. under the limelight light and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I might be completely wrong with my assumption, but you know, like I mentioned, I, I actually purchased the course for my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She's going through it and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's quite a process. The mm -hmm. SAM registration. Yes, it is. Yeah. The minority or women-owned business stuff yes. or veteran-owned business mm -hmm. applications. It's very lofty. And so I guess would you say that a lot of things were kind of tightened up after 
like your experience with the government or was this kind of in process regardless? And like, I guess what, what has changed in terms of the process? Mm -hmm. What, and I, is it the internet that made it like this? Cause I know it's a lot more of a process to get a SAM number and to, mm -hmm. and for all those that don't know what that is, that's essentially the code you have to register with the government and say, Hey, my yeah. company wants to sell you stuff. And yeah. you register and then you get this number that you use to bid on contracts. Right. That's but... how they track their uh, contractors. So every time you put in a bid, you, you have include to put that in, number, you have to right? Include yeah. that number. And that will have your history and and your payment information and all that stuff. Um so I've taught you know, my as I said, my partners, Logan and James, have uh, been doing uh, have laundry. been in the yeah, they've been doing laundry, government contracting for the past six, seven years. And the truth is, is that there have been some things that changed since when I was doing it, but the vast majority of it is still the same. Really? It's, yeah, there is. Are they more, do they like put more scrutiny on a new company supplying for a SAM code? Um, um, I have not heard that. I do know that one change they made, at, which I think is good for uh, con for new contractors, is that they increase the level of the of contracts uh value which require past performance so for example when there's uh when i was doing business uh, this is in the mid 2000s uh if a contract was under a hundred thousand dollars you didn't need to have any past performance which means you didn't need to prove to the government that you have done this business before in order to win the contract okay um which is a big stumbling block for new people because the you're new, you haven't done any business, so you can't, you're not eligible to win those contracts. Uh, these days, they put it up to 250000 Oh, they raised it? Yeah, so they it, raised it. It makes it easier. So okay. it makes it easier. opposite. Yeah, yeah, like, no, yeah. so they made it easier, and they made it, so it's it's easier to uh, win contracts as a new company, as a new uh, contractor. So that that's one positive thing they did. An another thing they changed, which I, I didn't really look into that much, but I, I saw in uh, one of my previous podcasts I'd done, someone commented in the in the comments um is that they don't do um uh fixed um i'm sorry uh um cost plus contracts the same way you ever seen the movie iraq for sale i haven't so it was, i yeah. watched this when i was like this is the entrepreneur i was maybe 14 years old i watched it and they talk about Halliburton or KBR yeah. and their cost plus contract. Right. And they literally yeah. had like those Mercedes trucks. Right. And like a tire would blow. Yeah. And they would just pull it over the side of the road and light it on fire. Yeah. Because the government was paying 7% plus yeah. uh, the pro it's cost terrible. of the item. Yeah. And so I can, yeah. I, as a, yeah. as someone that would, you know, one day love to have some yeah. contracts with the government, I'm like, damn. But as a taxpayer, I'm like, that's fucked that's up. That's fucked yeah. up. <laughs> um, I believe there's still yeah. some that exist, though. They're at like the, uh, yeah like one of the big f18 projects is right. cost plus and it, you yeah. know just to give a sense i think it was supposed to cost like a hundred billion and we're close we're over like 500 or i might yeah. be the number about the f35 is that's it yeah, yeah f35 yeah it's like yeah, the yeah. numbers have come in it's, it's, it's disgusting it's enormous yeah they usually do cost plus when uh when it's a new technology they're developing like a new fighter jet uh nasa was doing cost plus for a very long time and um it the incentives in in the classic cost cost plus situation was to increase the cost as much as possible because then you make more money. Yeah, you just on like top pour money down the drain. You're exactly. making seven percent on it. Right? Yeah. So uh, NASA switched actually with SpaceX. Uh, they were the first company to um, win a fixed price contract. Didn't they underbid yeah. everyone by like some insane amount? Yeah, I and think they it didn't... was less than half of what Boeing bid. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for trips to the space and no station. Windows will. Yeah. You know. Yeah, up, yeah, exactly. And flight. they've SpaceX has been uh, transporting astronauts to the space station, I think, for two years now, and Boeing hasn't even reached orbit with their capsules. Oh no, 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 they they did get to the space station. You know, I but flew in a Boeing but, yesterday. It was great. Uh, yeah. We landed. It was cool. But like, yeah, he, you know, it's like an American kind of hmm. aristocrat in terms of being in you know company, one of the oldest, most yeah. incredible companies in terms of aviation. Like, Tough couple of years, though. Yeah. And I would assume, yeah, yeah. and I know nothing about getting to space, I'd assume they could get up there, though. That's disappointing. Yeah, well, they've had a lot of troubles. Uh, what the cause of, of Boeing's troubles is debated, but I think most people would point to the McDonnell-Douglas merger with Boeing, where I think they had 
uh, their the managers from McDonnell Douglas come and and try to pretty much increase the stock price at any cost, which meant spending less on R and D and trying to reuse old designs, and that's what happened with the 737 Max. Uh, they pretty much used an old airframe, put bigger engines on it to make it more efficient. And they were like, let's ride, and which threw off the balance of it, and then they thought they could fix it with a software fix so that every time it tilts forward or, or like down or upwards, or it, it, like, it readjusts Calibrate the software, kind of... but the software had bugs in it, and that's what caused a few of their plane crashes. So it was, it was um, it, the, the, the design is fundamentally unstable. I understand yeah. wanting to get your share price up, but at the cost yeah. of what? It's yeah, exactly. Up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. tell me, like, you know, this is an online marketing show. Yeah. Um, and just read my question here. So, like, you know, when you were getting started, was first off kind of two part question: Was Sam.gov st still the place to go, or was it a different? Was it still all online? Or uh, so, well, it was called FBO.gov back then, Federal Business Opportunities. I remember this. Fed Biz Ops, they called it. Um, but it was they, all still. It online. was the same thing. It was all online. Uh, now they renamed it to Sam.gov. Um, some people don't like the new site. My partners hate the new site. The advanced they, searches are yeah. kind of tough. I was yeah. looking at uh, just like to play around right. and prep yeah. for the pod. And I, yeah. I will say that I have yet to experience a government website. I'm like, this is incredibly <laughs> developed. And you know what? Yeah. Someone bid on that contract. Yeah. So do better. Right. Um, but no, like, I guess my question, and it's more relevant to the folks listening here. Uh, does having like a web presence matter if you're going to bid on pro projects? Like if I'm a, mm. I believe you, the, an officer that's bidding on or, you know, mm -hmm. approving or working on a, a what is it? A, a bid? Or? Yeah. On a, on a bid. Yeah. On a bid. Yeah. Uh, I'm considering contractors and there's three, three companies here. Mm -hmm. Does it matter if you're, you know, let's say it's something like janitorial or, mm -hmm. or laundry. Does it matter if you have a website? Should you go do that type so of thing? I, I will say that we won a $300 million contract without a website. <laughs> in 2004, so, though. In, in 2007. We 2007, that, okay. Yeah, we won that contract in 2007. So that so at least back then, it didn't matter. Um, but websites are so easy to make. It's true. You just use Wix. Spend, we, you spend know. a weekend yeah. and write some content. Yeah. You can, you know. Yeah. Like, so it, it doesn't, it's it, not necessarily it, that important. But if you're right. bidding on a $300 million contract. You probably should have one. Yeah, I would say that if you're going to do so much work on on preparing the bid, the amount of effort to make a nice looking website is pretty low. And so if even if it gives you even if it's not in, like legally required, if it gives you just a tiny bit of uh, comfort, if it gives tiny bit of comfort to the contracting officer that you're a legitimate person, that's worth the effort and that's worth the investment. Nice. So yeah. I've been following you, uh, your War Dogs Academy on Instagram for mm -hmm. a few months now. And like one weekend, I was just aimlessly scrolling on Instagram and I saw like on the store, you guys posted like an example contract, like great starter contract. Right. And it was like a landscaping. Yeah. yeah. And so the first thing I thought about was like, okay, and and full disclosure, I'm not bidding on any contracts. Mm -hmm. I looked at a couple private aviation ones for the oh, travel yeah? agency. Nice. They wanted a like prisoner transport. I was like, Ooh, I don't know okay. how to do this. I I, I, I knew yeah. I knew all the economics of it. I read right. but I just I couldn't find an operator to dedicate oh, an I aircraft. See. Yeah, that's pretty Passing specialized, them. yeah. Um yeah. but it was like landscaping and the first thing that came to mind was well like two parts like number one like how do you not get screwed by the landscaping company? Good question. And and, and mm. what what happens in that situation mm. if you have two? You know, do you have a backup? Mm -hmm. And if that if something goes wrong and you got to call, you know, Plan B uh, landscaping right. services, does the government get super pissed, or what happens? So first of all, you can sign a uh, a non circumvention, non compete agreement. Uh, that those are legal. Of and course. So you sign that with whoever your, your service provider, your service provider, and then then they can't go behind your back and, and bid cut on you the out list. for ten yeah, points exactly. less or whatever. Exactly. So that's and that's you know one of the things we go through in the course, and we have um, templates, uh, templates exactly that's great. that people can use. Um, and uh, but yes, you are responsible. You as the prime contractor are responsible to manage your subcontractor. You got to get the job done. You got to get the job done, regardless of who does it. So let's say the subcontractor just stops showing up. Then it's what your do you problem. do? 
then you have to find another subcontractor immediately. Do you have to get them approved? So it depends on the situation. There are certain like uh, with clearance and yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If you're if you if the service is provided in a, on an army base where you need certain clearance for the personnel, there they have a process and that process can take time. And uh, and so, yeah, you will need to work through that. You know, the old adage, yeah. shit happens, right? So I'm assuming yeah. that the government knows shit happens. Yes. And, you know, people are nicer than others, but I'm assuming yeah. that this isn't the first or last time that something happens with Correct. a subcontractor. Different and... contracting officers, which are the government uh, uh, employees who are managing, managing the contracts, uh, they have different contracting officers have different levels of tolerance for shit happening. Bananigans, yeah. Yeah, for shit happening. And because there's there's famously or infamously, I should say, there's lots of uh, contractors who are trying to work the system and squeeze more profits out of the I, government. It reminds me and, of the scene in the movie yeah. when, you know, the guy in Iraq calls. Mm -hmm. he's yes. Like, and he's like the commander of the base. And he's right. like, all you guys are the same. You just fucking bid and try yeah. to squeeze your margins. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. If, you, if I don't get my guns here in the next day, yeah. I'm getting you black. Exactly. Or something. So and that is uh, that is based on real situations. Uh, my former partner Ephraim would try to do this quite often, where he would try to get the government to to uh, and to accept an an equal offer. They call it an or equal, uh, where it's not the same uh, item, but it's similar enough that you get the government to agree on a substitution, and. Usually the substitution is vastly cheaper than the original one. Oh, you just take the rest to margin. Exactly. And that significantly increases your your um, your margins. Um, and depending on what the situation is and what story you give to the contracting officer and how important that particular Part, uh, item that you're service, delivering or service is. is to the mission that the contracting officer is managing will depend on their to will inform their tolerance of how willing they are to let you well, do like, that. Well, like, you know, I'll give you a non government yeah. example. Like, you know, I said I've, it's kind of a passion business and shameless plug if anyone needs to charter a flight, hit me yeah. up. But I had a client <laughs> with a flight and they booked a, like a mid-sized jet. Mm -hmm. And then like a day before I get a call and they're like, hey, we have an issue with like the landing gear. Mm. We're, we're canceling your trip. Oh, wow. The term in that, in that world is a mechanical. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, shit, okay. Holiday weekend, like the worst possible uh -huh. scenario. And I'm like, okay, well, I got to find you new aircraft. The price is going to change. And then I ended up getting him something smaller mm -hmm. and it was cheaper. Okay. So I'm like, hey, you know, this round trip's, you know, it is a smaller aircraft. I apologize. I'm selling you this at break even. I don't even care. I just want to get mm -hmm. you to, you know, Tuscaloosa or wherever you're going. Like, here's the new price. It's a couple thousand bucks with the government because it's a contract. Can you like give them a credit or so you could offer them a discount? And oftentimes, if you offer them a discount, they're more likely to approve your substitution request. Cool. Okay. Because yeah. I thought it was so much like paperwork and stuff. It almost is. No, no. You yeah. could you could offer them a discount, and, and they like it. When, they, when you offer them a discount because the contracting officer has to justify their actions. Um, so if they are going to let you change... Because the they contract, have a boss too and they're exactly, like, hey... They have a boss and they don't... The last thing they want is to for it to look like they're doing... Hey, we have to anything. substitute it and it's going to yeah. be 30% more. Yeah, They're exactly, like, screw exactly. this. I'm going to rebid yeah. this thing. Yeah, exactly. And because they don't want to get in trouble. The the entire system is set up to prevent corruption. And... and when a contracting officer who's getting paid a standard government salary is dealing with millions or possibly hundreds of millions of dollars, there's enormous incentive and uh, there's a lot of money on the line. There's a lot of money on the line it's, for it's all of our money. Exactly. If you're in America. Yeah, exactly. And so there's a lot of potential for corruption there. And so the system is set up to try to prevent that. And uh, and and so obviously they're very the contracting officers are very concerned about any appearance of potential corruption. So if they're going to modify the contract after the award, it better be not, going down, which they are not supposed to do anyway, they better have an, uh, a, a really good, good justification reason. for that. Sure. Yeah. Have you or your partners that you're working with yeah. on the Academy ever lost money on a contract? Yeah. So they, uh, they lost money on a contract that they were willing to, I think one of their first contracts. And in, in fact, the reason they lost money, or I think they just barely broke even was because they didn't have any financing in the beginning and they got loan sharked. So the only financing they could get was like an insane payoff. It was something like 50% like interest, like over the course of like two or three months. Oh, it was insane. Like it should have been illegal. 
Uh, but they, but they were so desperate. If you have anyone that wants those same terms, yeah. uh, I, you have my cell phone number. Uh, yeah, yeah. Adam, don't worry, we're happy yeah. on this. I got yeah. them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, you know, what? I'll do forty eight percent. Oh, oh it's very uh, generous. Yeah, 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 a yeah. Couple yeah. basis points, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we're 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 going to set up a system for. Our... No, that's amazing. But yeah. so, like, it, I yeah. would assume that getting your f- foot in the door with this kind of a business, yeah, it was more impossible important. to lose money on yeah. a gig or break even or yeah. be very slim. Yeah, I, I like one story of a photographic memory was like mm-hmm. you know aim for five to twenty percent margins yes uh, that's right right? right yeah that's correct for those smaller contracts like twenty percent larger contracts tend to be closer to five to ten percent depending on how well you know the industry and there's ways of looking up uh like what the government had paid for this service or product in the past and that gives you a good well the website yeah. and it's sam.gov yeah. you can go there you can search by state right. you can and I'm butchering this. You can yeah. search by what division of government, like if right. it's the army, the you know the Coast Guard, yeah. the IRS, the Department of Justice, yeah. the Department of Health, Human Services, like yeah. they all bid for stuff. Yeah, they all do. Um, and there's more agencies than you even know it's, about. There's so many agencies. Not getting into politics. There's yeah. too many agencies. But I'll say that. Okay. Uh, it's like yeah. insane. Like the yeah. and you can also search like different categories. Right. Um, you know, tons of stuff. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but you could look at what you could look at previous awards, and that's a good way to get a feel of what the government is used to paying. And then you can that can inform your decision of what to bid on the contract. And we go into that in the course. And that that's a good way to make sure that you're not uh, completely underbidding the contract um, and you can maximize your profits on that. Yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, I love that. So then, you know. How long does it typically take to to get approval with Sam and all that stuff? That doesn't take to, you know, so I don't know offhand because I haven't done this in so long um, how how long it takes. I think it's just a few weeks to get all those approvals, though I'd have to confirm with you on that afterwards. Um, I know if you're certain licenses will take longer. So, for example, if you want to do the arms business. You need to get a federal firearms license, an FFL from the ATF, and that can take anywhere depending on how bad. That's a hard one to get, right? It's not hard. It's just long, right? So it usually takes, I think, about between one and three months, depending on uh, how backed up they are. I don't know how what their what the ATF's uh, workload is right now. When I applied for my FFL back when I was legally allowed to have one. I, uh, I it took I think about a month and a half to get it. Um, so yeah, I mean the the process to get an FFL, a uh, federal firearms license, is you have to uh, of course fill out all the paperwork, but also get your fingerprints registered with the FBI. You have to also have... team members, right? That correct. are working yeah. with yeah. if they're touching this. Uh... Correct. They want to make sure they know everyone who has access to automatic machine guns. That's a very important thing for them. That's for the fair. federal government. Uh, you have to have a, a gun safe a, in a secure location and to store the to store the firearms. And the ATF will send a agent to your office to inspect and make sure that everything is on the up and up. So they do um, a physical inspection. They do a for physical that. inspection. And that's the and so that's if yeah. you want to sell weapons. That's stuff. if you want to sell weapons. Yeah. Now I'm a brand yeah. new person. I just got my Sam. I'm ready to go. I got a new entity yeah. ready. I'm here. Yeah. You recommending me to get into arms? So there are advantages and disadvantages to every niche, right? I would recommend anyone who's starting out to get into anything that they are well aware of. Something right? they know about. Something so they're they not know just about. diving that's into right. something that they that's don't right. know anything about. It, 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 that's not to say that you can't get into something that you don't know about. I mean, my partners didn't know anything about laundry services, but they just f- they saw an opportunity and happened to get lucky on that. And then they built a past performance and were able to win bigger and bigger contracts. Uh, I had never done guns before, but but my my partner at the time knew a lot about it. So that was something that he specialized in because he knew so much about it. So I would recommend people who are starting out to do something that they are that they are specialized in, if possible. If they're not specialized in in it in anything in particular, then you could just go through the the listings in sam.gov and look at something that you think that you could understand i think understanding something uh, yeah. is is uh the first step and it makes it a lot easier to deal with that in a business context when you understand uh what you're dealing with sure okay 
I, I like that. Um, cause you know, I like, this is an online marketing show. Most people sure. are affiliate marketers and sure. they do launch an affiliate program. Right. If this is something you do, you know, you should promote it cause it's actually great content and educational, but I have a feeling that there's someone watching that has the itch right. to get into this. And so right. that's, you know, they're going to, they're going to potentially be a student, Yeah, but I also, you know, I just think it's important for them to like realize you don't need to go bid on like, you know, the F-35. Project. Well, you can, you know, you, I, I, you won't qualify for that. That's, that's a sole source contract. That's that they will only award that to Lockheed Martin because Ma Lockheed Martin's the only one who makes the F-35. That's true. I was, so it's a bad yes. example, but yeah, you yeah, know yeah, my yeah. point. But I, I know what you're saying. Um, yeah. You don't have to bid on complicated things. Um, the simpler, the better often. I would recommend uh, that people are just starting out um, delivering products, I think, is tends to be less complicated than delivering services because the services is something ongoing that you have to manage. And if uh, your service provider messes up or doesn't show up one day, then uh, then you get a very angry phone call from the contracting officer. But if you're delivering uh, products, if you're delivering physical goods, uh, then as long as you get a good source for those physical goods and that source can provide you the products that match all the government's requirements and they actually do deliver on that, then you're good. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a simpler thing. As long as the object, as the product itself, isn't particularly complicated beyond your understanding. So there are certain things, like, for example, uh, uh, very advanced computer equipment. You might need to be a computer guy to understand all the technical of course. details. But if you're, if it's delivering something... Any web simple, developers here, you yeah. go bid on all government websites. Just tell... Yeah, see the yeah they, they definitely need some improvement on their sites. That's for sure. Yeah. It's like Windows 95. It really is. It the is government true. moves slowly and particularly in the online. You, you know, let's touch yeah. on that i yeah. i've dealt with this with com yeah. nothing related to you know contract stuff just like i submit a form or something i need something, yeah uh you know you the government does move really slow yeah. so i've seen like on sam.gov mm -hmm. they submit you know they have like the the aviation when i was looking at it was like mm -hmm. uh march 3rd or something when i was looking at it it was like a couple weeks ago and it was it expired i believe on march 19th hmm. so march 19th comes around let's say i did bid on that thing mm -hmm. and i did not how long do they actually take to turn around and say you've won? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from that moment where, you know, like I just won my first contract or mm -hmm. I just won another contract. How long does it actually take for the wheels start to spin and the services to mm -hmm. be provided? Like what's this turnaround generally? So and I know a, it depends. But... There's a wide range. Uh, it can range anything from a few weeks. Uh, if they're in a big rush, they could work within days. Uh, so, for example, uh, my partner, uh, my partner is Logan and James. Uh, when the whole uh, Afghanistan um, withdrawal was happening, mm -hmm. I think it was 2020 uh, or 2021. I don't remember the 2021. Exact, 2021. Yeah, when when we were pulling out of Afghanistan, uh, a lot of the people that were airlifted out of Afghanistan got dropped off in in Stuttgart, Germany, and in, yeah. in the air base there. And so they had like a few thousand people they were taken care of, and all those people had laundry that needed to be cleaned. And the government was desperate because they did not expect such a big influx of people. They didn't they weren't prepared. Nothing. And yeah. so they they went to my partners and they said, hey, you know, we need these laundry services and we need it by tomorrow or, or the next day. You know, we have we have two days. What can you do for us? And of course, they scrambled like crazy and they managed to work up a solution. And they because it was so uh time sensitive the government was willing to pay anything i was you literally yeah. stole the words out of mouth i was to say yeah. i assume that the government paid for the convenience they of paid that for the convenience of the speed and they paid i i'm not saying that that they gave him an unfair price it was a as well, the government situating circumstances it. it's hey if you send yes. fedex yeah i do next day delivery exactly. by 9 a.m it's more expensive it's than noon and it's more expensive yes. than 6 p.m or than whatever this day so it's just and it the is government the the was end. thrilled i mean they my partners made a very nice margin on that contract much higher than their usual margin and the government was happy and they were thrilled or whatever they people were got thrilled their, their exactly because they were in a bad situation and they got the solution they needed so there are certain situations where the government is in uh, emergency mode where they can move very quickly but the the vast majority of contracts range from a few weeks to several months before they award. Will they negotiate with you? Yeah. Uh, so, Or if you bid, they just have to accept the bid. There's not like, hey, we'll give you this business, but this is coming a little bit hot or whatever. Uh, usually what they do is uh, is they will just they'll just analyze their offers 
and just pick their best offer. If there's certain situations where they're like not comfortable with a specific aspect of the bid, they will ask you to revise your bid. Like they'll say, like in our situation, um, we had a, um, uh, for the big contract, we won for the $300 million contract. Um, we had a source of supplies for certain artillery shells that were coming out of, um, out of I think it was, um, I think it was out of the Czech Republic. And we bid a certain contra a certain amount. And then uh, it, it was a two year contract. So we bid it like the same price and it was much larger quantity in the second year. And they came back to us and they're like, are you absolutely sure that you have enough quantity for the second year for at this price? And we kind of went back and I guess because they had like looked at all their other bids and they kind of got a feel of the market. They were they, like, they real? realized they realized that we made a mistake or it was potentially that we made a mistake and they were right. And so we're like, actually, uh, after looking over everything again, we have to go back and revise our bid. They're like, OK, yeah, just send send the bid revision. Uh, and so they will look things over. They want to set you up for success because once they sign that contract, it's much harder to revise the contract. So if they want they don't want to have to deal with having to cancel a contract because it costs them money if they have to cancel a contract. And they have to, to pay you something if they cancel a contract, not for cause. So it, it uh, for convenience they call it. So there are there are certain things that are put in place that I'm if, assuming that's a clause in yes, the proposal. Yeah, you say, hey, if we win the bid, yeah, and then you cancel it for whatever reason, yeah. that's not we screwed up. You still yes. have to pay us half or whatever it is. There there are certain uh, accommodations that the government builds in if they if they want to cancel it for and not uh, uh, a fair. justifiable reason. Yeah, there are commercial ram. Um, um, What's the term? Uh, uh, recourse. Well, recourse. There's commercial okay. rec There's recourse that you could have, and and in a worst case situation, you could actually take the government to court and sue them. And Sounds expensive, yeah. but if it's big, it, enough, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's yeah. It's obviously it's you know you mentioned the three hundred million dollar contract, yeah, yeah. and um, like I watched I watched War Dogs from the War Dogs penthouse a couple weeks ago. Oh, cool. And uh, cool. yeah, yeah. You should come to over and do it. You've probably seen the movie a hundred times. But anytime <laughs> we have the video wall up. Oh, cool. Um, you should come. Yeah. But I I remember the yeah. scene where yeah. um you know the actors portraying you and your partner are in the room with the con with the officers, right, and. They're like, you know, you came in a little bit lower yeah, yeah. than everyone else. And one of you is like, well, can you tell us how much lower? And they're like, we're not really supposed to. But yeah, they're not allowed to. That's 50 okay. percent. <laughs> I'm assuming 52 million. Under, yes. Yeah, there's no, some, there's yeah, something. Is that million. real? That actually was real. That happened. But it, it happened in a different way. So they are legally not allowed to tell you what how much you came in under and for good reason because they don't they want to get the best price for the government and that's they're legally required to so if if uh they inform you how uh how how competitive you are you might not be so competitive on the next contract uh so they're not supposed to tell you that but we did find out that we were 52 million under the next competitor because uh i was talking to a contracting officer on the phone and we were working out through some issues and he was he was telling me he's like yeah you know it was, we were go we were having some trouble with getting certain licenses flyover permits to deliver for the afghan contract because if you're flying military hardware over countries you need to get their permission to fly the, over their yeah that makes sense that stuff so there were certain countries that weren't giving it to us and it was delaying our shipment and it, the government was getting nervous and so i was you know working out all these issues with him and he he told me he's like you know uh, I, I know you guys are doing your best and we really want to help you succeed uh, because you guys are just so competitive and we you, we know you're a new guy on the block. And this and, was another contractor. Yeah. It, yeah it was, no, it was a it was a uh, contracting officer. He's a government employee. And he was telling me over the phone. He's he like, screwed we, up. huh? Yeah. What? That he wasn't supposed to say what he's about. No, to so say. so he's he, so he said, you guys were just so competitive. We really want to see you succeed. And I said, really? Uh, how competitive were we? And he says, he's like, listen. I'm not really supposed to tell you this, but you guys were $52 million under the nearest competitor. Did you throw the fucking phone? <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was like, 
Oh my God, we could have made another fifty million on this. <laughs> oh my God, that makes my blood pressure yeah. go up. Then I told Ephraim, and he lost his shit. He I was, mean, I, he was I, screaming. I, yeah, he was. He really lost it. Did that yeah. contract actually get fulfilled, or was that the one that caused you guys like legal so issues and stuff? That so we fulfilled. Um, I should say he fulfilled because I. I I quit about uh, a few months into it because he informed me he didn't want to pay me. Um, but he continued delivering on it for another six months after that. Uh, and I think by the time they canceled our contract, I think he had delivered $67 million out of the 300. So, yeah, I mean, he ma he was making like a good 15 to 20% margins on it. Sure. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. David, I... Uh... I do usually talk on this podcast. Just oh, okay, so you know. yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. I, <laughs> no, you I, guys have I, been, you guys have been, you guys have been uh, killing it. I've just kind of been yeah. a fly on the wall. This has been awesome. I do want to ask a question, um, sure. if that's okay with my co-hosts. Uh, no, please, dude. I apologize for hogging. No, the no, you're here. cool. I just, this I love has been this good. Shit, no, know? I didn't want to jump in because it was. I mean, it's great content. I'm, I'm curious. You know, we talk about mental health on the show from time to time. Like, did you have like some serious like PTSD and like oh mental health God. issues. Like, I don't know what parts of the movie were real, like we talked about, but like getting shot at and chased by like insurgents and getting the shit beat out of you. And like, I, I right. mean, like you can comment or not on which of those was yeah. real, but I'm sure no matter what, like there was some, some mental health issues coming out of it. So I'm curious, like, how did you kind of deal with it, you know, right after it happened? And what are you kind of still doing today to like keep that at bay, if that makes sense? Great question. Um, so I definitely had some PTSD from the whole, from the whole ordeal, but not from those particular two things because I did not get kidnapped and I did not drive through the triangle of death. Okay, cool. Uh, sorry to disappoint I like, everybody. I was like, I'm damn. Fuck yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I will say the interesting thing about the triangle of death scene is that it actually is true. But it just it was... didn't it didn't happen to us. It happened gotcha. to the guy who wrote the screenplay for the War Dogs, the War Dogs screenplay, mm. a guy named Stephen Chin. He um, he got the contract to write the War Dogs screenplay because he had written another screenplay called Iraq, Iraq, which was about these two American contractors who were actually on the ground in Iraq at the time. And he, to write that screenplay, he wanted to go visit them in Iraq. But but That's there wild. was uh, there were no commercial flights going into Iraq at the time. So they had so, to fly in like what Kuwait. So no, or... so he flew into Jordan. Jordan, okay. And he hired a Jordanian driver to drive him in, to Baghdad. And the Jordanian driver decided to stop in Fallujah, which was the most dangerous city in the entire country, because no one was manning the gas station, so you can get some free gas. Oh and <laughs> and then they got shot at by insurgents uh, on their way out, and they got saved by the U.S. Army, similar to how it was in the movie. Um, so that actually happened. And when Steven was writing the screenplay, uh, Todd Phillips, the director told him, you know, these guys are just sitting behind a desk too much. We need, we need more action in this movie. Yeah. So why don't you put your story in there? And so, so there was, there was a Beretta deal that was a re based on a real deal, but we actually defaulted on that contract. We did not. Uh, so uh, when, when that, that happened contract. back to, you know, yeah. we talked about getting, um, like, What's the term when they cancel you? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Went, uh, canceled for cause. Canceled for cause. Were you yeah. canceled for cause? On we that? were canceled for cause. Did that. that? But you were not banned forever, like we they were not in the movie. Because we I remember, not. like, uh, you know, Ephraim yeah. in the movie, and he's like, "We're fucked if yeah, we don't yeah, get yeah. these guns." Yeah, they, they, it's a death sentence. It was not a death sentence, at least not back then. Maybe they've changed the rules now, but, uh, but uh, we were nervous that it was gonna be a death mm -hmm. sentence because that's is how the contracting officers will portray. So, what actually happened with that yeah. with that contract? We just uh, did not deliver on it. And they canceled it. Is it because you couldn't get the permit? You couldn't yeah, get them in the country. We or couldn't whatever? get the permit to fly it out of. We couldn't get the export license from Italy. So you had the had, guns. Yeah, well, we had. We were contracted or... to buy the guns, and then we just couldn't get the the export license from Italy because they had banned sales to Iraq. I have to say, never in my life would I thought I'd be asking questions about guns shipped from Italy to Iraq in yeah. the in a room at the movie was filmed that and stuff I, and i watched yeah. this movie you know years ago and i, yeah. I like that's it's a crazy world yeah so you yeah. you've I, actually had that con canceled for cause before yeah that that, that, that did happen i think in total we actually had i think five contracts canceled for cause in total throughout the you know over the years but uh as far as i am aware of it did not prevent us from winning contracts 
and, and maybe it was because the contracting officers didn't do their research, uh, didn't look up our company and, and maybe they're doing better job with that now. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but we kept on bidding and kept on getting awarded contracts. Well, David, I want to, I want to ask you a question about the movie, not so much its accuracy, but like what your involvement was like, did you, were you like on set? Were they coming to you for, Hey, I, what was it was like for you movie. in this? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I, yeah, I do have a little. Oh, family. really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I miss that. You, if you watch it again, you'll notice me. I, I'm like, I noticed you oh, yeah. without meeting you because oh, I've yeah? seen your Wikipedia, whatever. Oh, okay. And I watched a couple weeks ago and I went, and then I checked your, and it was correct. I'm not yeah. going to, you can, you can say the rest, but I yeah. noticed it. But did yeah, they like come yeah. to you like when they were trying to get, you know, the character down? Like, were you giving them feedback on like, oh, he should act more like this? Or were you kind of pretty hands off on that regard? So they did buy my life rights, they call it, right? The the rights to my life story, uh, they, which they didn't have to do. Uh, they could have just bought the book. They could have, yeah. I mean, like, they actually didn't have to buy anything. Uh, the way it works is that if you if your name appears in print or in on like TV, you are now officially considered a public figure, even if you're you're only you only appear in an article once. Oh wow! Yeah. That's uh, if your name appears in the papers, you're now a pub public figure. And because of the freedom of speech, anything can be said about any you. public figure. Uh, yeah. And and uh, there's and they could say completely factually incorrect things. They could make a whole movie about me that was completely false and Crazy. very damaging to my reputation. And and it's you really it's, couldn't do much about that. There's not much you can do oh, about wow. it in this country. Um, the libel laws in this country are pretty weak. And in other countries, it's like the UK has much stronger libel laws. Okay. So you can sue people over there, but but not in the United States. So they didn't have to buy my life rights. They could have made a movie about me with my real name and and portrayed me in any way they wanted. But um, but what usually when a Hollywood film gets made and they're spending 50 to 100 million dollars to make a movie, uh, they want to have as much edge as possible to create the best possible movie. So they will make a deal with some of the people involved to get the inside scoop, the inside uh, uh, information to make it a bit more realistic, a bit more interesting. You're like consulting so about you. That's exactly it. So how does it, how does it work with a movie? Are they like for like a movie that's based on you? Do they say like, we want to pay you this much money to make this movie about you and we have full creative control over it? Or yeah. is it, Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's so just a flat get, fee up front. It's they, not like it's a royalty. So it's usually so usually the way it works is they will option the story, right? So they'll give you usually it's in the in uh, like ten like tens of thousands of dollars, you know, low tens thousands. Like you, you know, want the like, right to do this. Exactly. You this is you and it, obviously every situ every story is different. Um uh, so, uh, and of course, depending on who the production company and who the Everything director, matters, yeah. you know, that will affect the, the price and how many people are competing for the story. But usually it's in the low 10,000s, uh, to option the story and, uh, and they get like a certain window to start production. So usually they option it for like a year and a half or three years. And if that, if they don't start production within that time frame, then they usually have an option to renew uh, for an additional amount of money for an additional few years, um, but and if they don't start production by that time, then then you can go back. Then to you can shopping. go and shop it around exactly. But if they do start production, then they need to pay you the rest of the money that you, they agreed on, which is usually like around ten to twenty times more than the option amount, and uh, and sometimes you can negotiate a certain percentage off the uh, the box office but it's almost always a percentage of the net which always turns out to be zero in hollywood accounting <laughs> right uh in uh it, i think gone with the wind famously is still losing money right <laughs> <It's> <laughs> one, one of the most successful movies of all time but but they the way they do the accounting there's never any net profits for any movies. And that's why all the actors and the directors, they always get a deal based off the gross of the box office. It's never the net uh, because they know the, how the accounting is done. Unfortunately, as a Hollywood outsider, I didn't have enough leverage to make a deal off the gross. So I, I was supposed to get 2% of the net, which, of course, turned out to be zero. So, so you just sell the, 
you sell the rights I mean, to your I got story. The initial amount. So you, even yeah. though like it's on like Netflix or whatever, I, or, I so, think I rented it through YouTube. So I paid like so three bucks. You don't get random I checks. Do, I do. Or they're not, like seven cents. I do get random checks, but I get it for my appearance as an mm. actor in the film. Yeah. As my three second appearance on as a, in my cameo on film. Every, that's what you get. Paid. Yeah, that's that what is I get so fun. So I, I so you get a one time, story. you get a yeah. one time payment up front, and you sell your story for them to do yeah. with it what they will. It's yes, funny you use exactly. the term. And, and you get zero control. They 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 tell you we have one hundred. Like we're gonna put you in a truck, and you're getting shot at by insurgents. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. Oh, it didn't we'll really happen, but it's I mean, cool. The, yeah. They also in the story, they also uh, uh, talk about how I was lying to my girlfriend, and that part was completely untrue. For the record, uh, my girlfriend knew exactly what I was doing the entire time, and she was. Did totally you have a cool baby on it. the way during? I that? did. Yeah. Cool. My, my daughter's seventeen now. So wow, that's crazy. It's been a little bit of time since then. Yeah. That's so, incredible. like, yeah, have you watched the term Hollywood accounting? I had a yeah. team member once yeah. negotiating like a commission structure, and yeah. I was like, "Hey, like this, you know, after pro you know costs, whatever." And he goes, "Like I've known this guy for fifty years." He goes, "Is it like Hollywood accounting?" He, he grew up in LA. He's like, "Is it like am I actually going to get paid or is it like Hollywood accounting?" I was like, "Bro, you're going to get thing. paid." Yeah. It's not, and I didn't yeah. know it's a real thing. And oh, yeah, here's yeah. the no, term no. again. It's the second time it's, I've heard it's this. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. Oh. It's it's, so, it's infamous. And it's sorry David, for interrupting you, Josh. What was your question? No, no, we're good, man. We've we've covered it basically. Um, I was going to ask if uh, have you watched the movie with your daughter, and was that like a really interesting experience? So I actually just watched it with her for the first time like two months ago. That's insane. I know. Which you were like, you were me. like, you were yeah. like, I'm going on the affiliate marketing show. I need to watch this again. And, you need a uh, refresher. A refresher. Yeah. 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 You know, it's it's so weird because she knew about the movie, but she didn't really know it, what what it was about. And what I thought was the weird thing was that she didn't really seem to be particularly interested in it. Which I thought was weird. I'm like, you know, if if there was a Hollywood movie made about my dad, I would be very curious. Dude, I'd wear shirts of the movie. Yeah. I'm a big fan of my dad. I mean, you know, so, me too. And and but she was just like, she's more into like anime and cartoons and and stuff. And it, the 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 genre is very much not her genre. Like so action slash comedy. Yeah, really yeah her she just it, it was not up her alley at all. But but she um. She told me because she had I think she was like on YouTube and she met, she stumbled across the trailer for the movie. And there's a part in uh, like one of the trailers, the different versions of the trailer. But one of the trailer, Miles Teller, uh, you know, says in the voiceover, my name is David Packhouse and I'm an international arms dealer. And she says, I saw that. And I was like, what? You're not David Packhouse. You're not my dad. And she's like, it just destroyed the believability of it for me. So I don't think I could enjoy this movie. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, she knows the real David yeah, Packhouse. Yeah, That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So one question I've had, um, I know that the, you know, I guess Sam.gov or the federal government in general, they do have like, they, they try to give uh, bids to like veterans, uh, women owned businesses, disabled yeah disabled uh, uh, minority everything yes, so like uh, also economically disadvantaged areas like locations so if you're in a there's there's a lot of set aside so there. what yeah. what is the actual advantage of you know if if i am a you, you know qualify. a veteran or a woman-owned right. business etc right uh in terms of winning contracts is there like a set percentage of contracts they set aside yes kind of just give me like a you know a quick overview of that side of the world of government right. contracts right so and this is where um knowing how the government works and what what is out there is an enormous advantage because they're the government is required to by law have certain set asides and it goes by percentage of the budget right so i don't know the numbers offhand but it's it's significant i think something along the lines of like 20 or 30 percent of the budget needs to go to small business oh right? that's a lot yeah it's an enormous i mean this if the government spends like 6.7 trillion a year so that's like a good two trillion dollars going to small businesses that's wild and so uh so that means that you as a small business are you qualify to win this contract while a large company simply does not qualify. So they cannot win those contracts. So you are only competing with other small businesses. And the same goes for other set aside. So if you're a veteran owned business or disabled owned business or woman owned business or economically disadvantaged area owned business, uh, located business, um, then the, the, the parts of the budget that are set aside for those, for those set asides, 
uh, can only go to people who are have that designation, which drastically reduces the competitive landscape and gives you a much better chance of winning the contract. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. And that's a separate thing you have to apply for, though, right? Yes, you need to, to apply. Member, correct. Same correct. Code. This the 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 I think they call it the cage code, um, unless they change the name. But uh, they the um, the uh, there's there's different uh, registrations you have to do with the federal government to to bid on it in general. But then you apply for the different set aside qualifications. Yeah. Amazing. And different set asides have different levels of applications. Um, so there are certain programs that are very difficult to get into and take a long time. And some of them can take months to like qualify. But once you get in there, it's like almost guaranteed. There's obviously there's no guarantees in life, but there's, it's practically guaranteed that you're going to win some significant contracts because so few people qualify for those set asides. That's incredible. Okay. Yeah. And that's, I think that's important for people to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So any sweat set aside, you could even conceivably qualify for, you should apply because it's going to be an enormous uh, advantage. So, you know, I believe you're you're launching the course and yeah. like releasing, you know, you did some pre-orders and stuff. Yes. Uh, I, is it April 9th? April 9th. Cool. Launch. So official launch. Six days away. from So next Tuesday. Correct. Cool. Congrats. How long yeah, have you been working you. on thank the you. content and putting everything together? Uh, so we've been working on making this happen for about six months. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, cool. yeah, it's exciting. So, like, yeah. for the listeners, obviously, we've talked about this for, like, two hours, but I'd yeah. love to just let you pitch it a little bit just so everyone can kind of know sure. uh, what the, what you got because I'm sure someone's going to join and people yes. are going to be interested. Yeah. Uh, so, right. So, we're starting War Dogs Academy to get in, a, in a nutshell. It's an online course to teach you how to uh, set up a company, register your company with the federal government, Apply for all the potential set asides that you qualify for, so you get as much of a um, competitive advantage in the marketplace. How to identify contracts that you have a good chance of winning, and how to uh, find sources in the marketplace to deliver on those contracts. How to manage the contracts. How to deal with the contracting officers. Um, different. Uh, potential downfalls that you can avoid, mistakes that we've made, uh, and of course, how to uh, work the logistics and the financing. And pretty much we're uh, creating an entire um, school for how to get into, how to go from zero to hero in this industry. Nice. And it, it's uh, the Instagram is just War Dogs Academy, War right? Dogs Academy on, War Dogs on Academy. Academy on all socials, too. Yeah. WarDogsAcademy.com. Um, War Dogs Academy on Instagram, X slash Twitter. Um, I think I think we also have a TikTok. Nice. We're, we're we're on all the uh, social social media nice. platforms. Nice. And I hate to jump back to one last yeah. question, but it yeah. came to mind. And I think we kind of addressed it earlier, but you know, you mentioned that if I'm getting into this, you would say you don't necessarily recommend starting with a service based contract, mm -hmm. but find an item or a good to right. provide. Yeah. Um, why is that? And I guess let's just jump on that question. If so, I'm getting started, where would you, what, right? Where would you store me to go? Right. So I say that be, I think I'm a little bit biased because most of the contracts I've worked on were were product based rather than service based. My partners, Logan and James, their bread and butter is services, so they would probably say services are better. There are advantages to services. It could be an ongoing thing, so it could be like a continual money. Coming yeah, it's in. residual revenue. Exactly, then. it's residual revenue, and and those service contracts tend to get. But there's uh, more opportunities for it to go wrong, right? Correct. So it's it's more active management. Now, if you find the right subcontractors, you could set it and forget it because if but someone but that's yeah. that's an if, right? Yeah. Oftentimes your subcontractors may be good for a little bit and then maybe not so much later, and then you may need to replace them. But that's part of the uh that's part of the things that you deal with when you're dealing with a service contract. Now there's other things that can go wrong with uh with delivering products like you can end up buying products that don't meet the government's uh, quality. Uh, and then you have a real problem. And then you have a real problem. And so you have to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. You have to, if it's a large contract, you should go inspect the products and make sure that they actually are what the government is expecting. Because if they're not, they're not going to pay for it. So when when you deliver and if the, the receiving officer, uh, the one doing the inspection on the delivery, if he looks at the requirements on your contract and you have something that does not match, 
then he may reject the delivery, and then you're kind of screwed. Because you have a bunch of shit you just paid for. Because you just paid and, for it. Yeah. And exactly. the government's like, we're out. And yeah. then you're, there's no fight. You're done. Yeah. I mean, if you don't follow the terms of the contract, you're out of luck. Do you recommend, uh, like, if I'm, do you recommend someone work with a lawyer when they're doing, going through the contract review, at least the first so, one or? Yes. So we have, uh, um, my partners have uh, a lawyer that, that they use for any time they get into issues with the government. And he specializes in government contracting uh, in particular. Um, if it's a very large contract, probably a good idea a 50, to have. $100,000 contract. Yeah. Then, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it so much. Generally, the government isn't so... Uh, they it, don't scrutinize the 60K contracts versus the $300 million correct, contracts. So correct, correct. And, and these days, it's anything under $250,000. They're much more lenient about cool. it. So, and though they consider uh, under a quarter million to be a starter contract. So they won't require past performance, uh, which means you don't need to prove that you've done this business before. So pretty much as long as you are registered with the government, you qualify for all those contracts and you can win all those contracts because they're, they're not even looking at past performance and the past performance is oh, for contracts over 250k over 250 do they ever make K. exceptions like if they you bid and you have no past performance but you so it's a six hundred thousand dollar contract can they get exemption or sometimes they are a little bit more flexible on what they consider to be past performance so for example they can uh, and it depends on the contract and it depends on the agency you're delivering and how how sensitive they deem to be the contract to be and how how nervous they are that this gets done right. But uh, they may accept uh, your having done business in the commercial sphere as past you have some re you have some references that are valid exactly. and vetted that are not the exactly. government but you sold so and so exactly. these services and they're like okay or you could say i am working with a consultant who has and this is the consultant's resume and they have all this experience or my subcontractor has all these experience and sometimes they will accept that and last one, I know Josh has children screaming in the background or something. No, no, they're coming home yeah. soon. So I'm just looking at the <laughs> clock here, dude. Waiting for them. Do you have yeah. to um, disclose who your subcontractors are? And does the government cut people out? So it depends on what the contract is. Uh, usually for, okay, so for services, uh, where, especially where where your subcontractors are going to have to go on like a restricted area, like an army base, then you absolutely need to. So you, I've register like the, all with of the that. one that I told you about that yeah. I looked at. You have to register any pilots or crew that you have. Yeah, with clearance with whoever yeah, it was exactly. and stuff, and right. that that's makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, so you need to do it like that. But if you're buying, you know, food or something, as long as or clothing, as long as you follow the the specifications of the contract. Uh, they generally don't ask who your source, Amazing. who your source is. Yeah, that's I, cool. For very large contracts, they usually will because they want to. But I assume the government's not going to yeah. circumvent because yeah. they don't. Oh no, people didn't submit they, a bid. They they can't circumvent. You do them. It, well, and they can't because the the government has to go through the contracting procedures. If those people didn't submit a bid, they. They didn't submit they're, a bid. They they're didn't not submit included a bid. in the they, party. They, they can't award them a contract because they don't have a cage code and they didn't submit a bid. And even if you do have a cage code and even if you have all the past performance in the world, if you don't submit a bid, you're not going to win the contract because that's they require it to be put in a sp very specific format uh, and it has to yeah, it has to check all the boxes. And don't kill me, Josh. Just one last one just came to mind. Yeah. Do you Have you ever... Uh, had experience with like state or city or local uh, contracts and is the process fairly similar so i personally have not but uh but i have been told that i've spoken to quite a few people that the state uh, particularly the state contracts are in the united states are somewhat similar to the federal system um they just tend to be obviously smaller. usually be a lot smaller cool yeah sure. yeah so, I mean, the federal system is just so big and there's so much money in it that I think for someone who's brand new to the business, there is more than enough uh, business to go after that. That Just learning the federal system is probably a better investment of your time than makes learning sense. an individual state system. Perfect. Before yeah. I pass it back to you, Josh, I just would like to say I'm not wearing socks today. And if you're the person that left a comment that was mad that Adam <laughs> is wearing socks, I have also... <laughs> Opted out of socks, um, and you know I hope we're we see you next week. But fuck that. <laughs> hey, 
David, real quick, can you explain Singular Sound, the other company yes. that you are the CEO the of? Music. Oh, in, yeah? Uh, cool. yeah, in like in like a minute or two, let's say, can you sure, tell sure, us I'll about the it. company and what yes. specifically what innovative tools you guys have developed for musicians? Because, sure. you know, as Harrison said, a musician myself, I'm just selfishly curious what it's all about. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy. Well, to I talk apologize about for not asking you about it earlier. Oh, no, it's OK. It's OK. I, I understand Singular Sound. Uh, we make products for musicians. So it is a very niche industry. Most people are not musicians, so would not be particularly interested in it. Um, I got into it, uh, actually the, the way singular sound came about was while I was under house arrest, I got sentenced for the whole war dog situation. I got sentenced to seven months of house arrest. I was extremely lucky. I avoided prison. Um, uh, but, uh, while I was under house arrest, I, I would have my musician friends come over and play, uh, you know, jam out. I play guitar. I'm a singer songwriter. And but of course, no, none of my drummer musicians friends are going to bring their drum set over because a massive pain in the butt to move the drum set. So I bought a drum machine to have a beat to play along with. But of course, drum machines are really um, designed to compose beats uh, for people who don't know their their tabletop device with a bunch of buttons on it. And each button makes a different drum sound. You can make beats on it uh, by playing it and then it plays it back in a loop. And so I was using it to play guitar along with, but of course, every time you want the beat to change, like you're going from verse to chorus or to a bridge or, or something, uh, I had to stop playing my guitar and tap the button on the machine and it interrupted the flow of the music. So I thought, I really need a drum machine that's in the form of a guitar pedal. A uh, guitar pedal is a little device on the floor with a little pedal, you tap it with your foot so that you could control the beat uh, hands-free and nobody made it. But all my musician friends thought it was an amazing idea and they all wanted to buy it. So uh, it took me about three years, but eventually I created it. It's, some, it's uh, called the Beat Buddy, like your buddy that plays the beat. You can Google it if you're curious. And it was, uh, it is the world's first uh, drum machine guitar pedal hybrid. Uh, patents uh, uh, have, been, have been issued, so... So you can't copy it, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it was, we won a whole bunch of musical industry awards for it. And one of the coolest experiences I've had, uh, in, in that industry was, um, uh, one of my favorite bands is Alice in Chains, um, their grunge band from the nineties. And I learned how to play Alice in Chains songs on guitar. Uh, that's how actually I learned how to play guitar was playing Alice in Chains songs as well as Pearl Jam and Nirvana and all those bands. And, uh, I was at a trade show. And this guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, you make the beat buddy, right? And I said, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm Mike Inez. I'm the bass player from Alice in Chains. Oh my I just God. bought the beat buddy Sick. two weeks ago and I've been writing all my new music with it. It's an awesome composition tool uh, You know, while I'm on the road. It's so much fun. And I was like, holy crap, I learned to play guitar. Yeah. Learned your songs full and circle now moment new songs with my invention it was just such a such a gratifying thing it was That's so sweet. cool yeah and when they came to miami i got backstage passes to meet the band so yeah that, i felt like that was when i arrived <laughs> nice. are you spending yeah. what do you spend most of your time on right now yeah so right my main business is singular sound uh we've created a, a several other products uh for the musicians out there we have we created the world's most advanced looper pedal um uh for people who do looping you know records your music and plays it back in a loop uh we've also created uh one of the easiest to use midi foot controllers to control your other pedals uh as well as a uh, uh, something that winds your cables up real quick that's uh, makes uh, putting cables away really easy uh so that's my main business um recently uh and currently i'm very focused on because you're doing on, the launch and stuff yeah, sure I'm doing the launch for josh can you just Academy. veer your head to the left so he can see what's behind you uh, I mean, just he has some, him just here, some like shit. Like... He probably, I don't know. Are you hip to like Tame Impala and stuff? Uh, what'd you say? Tame Impala. You ever heard of them? Oh no, I don't know. Wow, Josh, yeah, your yeah. indie music is dude. He's a nineties. He's a nineties. He's a nineties yeah. grunge guy. We're we're on oh, different yeah. pages yeah, I'm here. A, yeah. I don't you know. know some, on much. some episodes, yeah. Josh yeah. has like a guitar behind him. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Oh, yeah. When I, well, I mean, I usually am in the basement with all my shit behind me, but it flooded, so I'm I'm back upstairs today. Yeah. Lucky to be in Florida. Oh man, yeah. Where are you, Josh? I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. 
born oh, and raised. In Cleveland, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually gonna say yeah. he's in Fallujah, but it, <laughs> I'm in Fallujah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice callback, David. I, I really yeah. appreciate you coming on the show, yeah. man. We for My sure partner. would love to have you back. I mean, as you, as Thank everyone you. can see, let's have you back with your partner sometime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's yeah, definitely get great. you back. Yeah. For for myself, Josh from Offer Vault, Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, and David Packhouse. CEO of Singular Sound and former VP of AEY Incorporated. The man that War Dogs is based off of. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We will see you next time. Affiliate Marketing.